Morning, everybody. Morning, and welcome to today's event. Um, I'm Mark Mazur, the Robert C. Posen Director of the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, and, and I'm excited at the top-notch program that we have for, for you all today. Um, first off, I'm, I'm really pleased that the Tax Policy Center is co-hosting this event with the Kellogg School of Management at Northwestern University. We've co-hosted a couple events um, with, uh, with the Kellogg School in the last year or so. They've been um, incredibly interesting and informative events, and we're hoping that this is uh, more, more of the same in, 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 that, in that regard. Um, I'm certain that today's event, titled the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, uh, a boost to growth or a missed opportunity, will add to the reputation for these, these co-hosted events. Um, we have three components for today's, today's event. Um, the program is all focused on the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act that was signed into law by President Trump in December. Um, as you know, this was the um, largest tax overhaul since the 1986 Tax Reform Act. has a lot of significant components that people in tax policy community are working overtime to understand and to determine the likely implications of this major piece of, of legislation. The, the three components for today's program are, first, a, a keynote address by, by Jason Furman. Second, a presentation of a paper written by Ben Harris and Adam Looney that is being released today and then a panel discussion looking at the economic growth aspects of the Tax Cut and Jobs Act that will be moderated by, by Catherine Rampell. Um, before I introduce our first speaker, I'd just like to acknowledge our online audience, in addition to the people in the room today. Um, all of you should feel free to share your thoughts and observations on Twitter using the, the hashtag Live at Urban. Um, and for the Q&A sessions, People um, should feel free, people in the audience should feel free to raise their hand. We'll get a microphone over to you to ask questions. Um, people who are watching online should email their questions and comments to events at urban.org so we can add those questions into, into the mix. Now, um, let me introduce our, our lead-off speaker today, Jason Furman, who's currently professor of practice at the Kennedy School at Harvard University and a senior fellow at the Peterson Institute for International Economics. Um, Dr. Furman has a storied career in public policy, serving twice at the President's Council of Economic Advisors, a staff economist, and then later as uh, chairman. He's also served on the President's National Economic Council. And Jason's worked on a wide range of issues, from public finance to international economics to macroeconomics to health policy to technology policy and, and, and on and on. I, I've um, personally had the privilege of working closely with Jason. Um, over, over the years, he truly is an amazing policy economist. He has this uncanny ability to sort of see around corners and figure out what parts of the academic literature can be applied to particularly thorny public policy problems. And that's, that's an incredible talent, and I think he's been very valuable to the policymakers in, in a couple of administrations. Um, and Jason also has the ability to, to handle a large number of, of policy problems at, at the same time essentially just juggling um, all, these, all these issues. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Dr. Jason Furman. Uh, thank you, um, Mark, for having me here. I vividly remember when I was at CEA in 1996, I started there, I walked into your office and I learned about this publication called Tax Notes because I think a large stack of them almost <laughs> fell on me off of your desk. I don't know if your desk still looks that way. Um, but it's, it's great to be here and great to have a chance to reflect on the tax law, which was um, the most significant piece of legislation in decades, has some good elements, has on balance from my perspective um, a number of very problematic elements, but I think the most important thing is two things. Going forward, one, what should we do next? Because we're going to need to pass more tax legislation um, in the future. And number two, for the analytic community that's represented in this room, what can we do even better next time to help inform um, policymakers, knowing that policymakers don't always love um, our analysis, and when they have a choice of analysis, often find the one they find most congenial. But I think there's still some things um, that we can do better as well. So I'm going to start um, on the topic of GDP, and that's going to be presenting 
um, a very short version of a paper that Robert Barrow and I wrote for the Brookings Papers on Economic Activity earlier this year, which is a really interesting um, experience of coming together with um, a common view. Then I'm going to talk about some things that weren't in that paper. Um, the first of them is national income. That just wasn't in the paper because we ran out of time. Um, welfare, which I think is a really um, important topic and one that we in the policy community should remind people about over and over again. Then a little bit about how will we know whether the tax cuts did or didn't work or achieve their goal. And finally, um, what's next. And by the time I get to what's next, I may be talking very quickly, um, which is fine because I think I have the same views as Ben Harris and Adam Looney, who you'll be hearing from later. Um, so first on GDP. In broad terms, the tax law will affect growth in three ways. One is businesses will have some additional cash. Economists tend to think that means nothing because the constraint on investment in recent years hasn't been that companies don't have the money for investment. They can't find the projects um, they want to invest in and having extra money doesn't do anything um, for that problem. But there may be some small effects, especially for financially um, constrained firms. But I won't have anything more to say about cash flow than that. Um, the second is the fiscal impact, which is a stimulus in the short run and crowding out over the medium and long run. So it goes from a positive to a negative. Um, and then finally, and this is what um, Robert in my paper was on, this is what most of the medium and long-term analysis centers around, is it changes the incentives. So a project that used to not be profitable to invest in at a lower tax rate, um, change tax incentives might now be profitable to invest in. And so those incentives change over time. On the fiscal side, um, we'll see this calendar year a stimulus of 1.2% of GDP. That's relative to um, a baseline of what was in the law in 2000, I mean, what, continuing what was already in, in policy in 2017. We get an extra stimulus above and beyond that of 0.4% next year, and then we'll have contractions um, in the following two years. And I think from across the spectrum, no one doubts that um, at the very least you would get a demand side effect and then potentially supply side effects from that as well. Um, everyone in this room knows that that is also the flip side of that is deficits and deficits that are growing over time um, to more than 5% of GDP. And I think we all know how extraordinary this is. Um, if you look at the average deficit as the share of the economy when the unemployment rate's below 5%, um, the deficit's average is 0.3% of GDP in that circumstance. Below f um, so we're, we're way out of step with where we've been um, and where other countries are. Our focus, though, is on the incentives. Um, our model won't talk a lot about it, but it's a Cobb-Douglas production function. It's an infinitely elastic supply of capital, so you get as much capital as you want. Um, it, in the main case, doesn't raise interest rates, doesn't um, crowd out capital from other sectors. The um, capital is allocated in competitive markets, and agents have perfect foresight, unchanging tax code. And then a very important assumption is when you have a deficit, you need to close your model, and we close it with lump sum financing. So the spending cuts don't help the economy, the spending cuts don't hurt the economy. And whenever you look at a macro estimate, the macro estimate is as much about the policy you're looking at as it is about the financing you're assuming for that policy. Um, if you look at the impact on user costs, the blue bar is relative to what was in the law in 2017. The orange bar is relative to the baseline. These are both showing the law as written. You see um, large reductions in the user costs for structures and rental residential. A large increase for R&D, because that's amortized rather than expensed and in the past, and a relatively small effect on equipment, which is taxed more heavily than it was in 2017, because bonus depreciation is eventually, um, that was in the law in 2017, is eventually phased out. Um, it's taxed less heavily than would otherwise have been um, the case. If you look at the pass-through sector, this is very dependent on whether 
um, the pass-through provisions get extended or not. This is in the law as written case, assuming that they don't get extended. The user cost is generally higher than it was in 2017, higher than it would be um, in the baseline, and you see that especially for R&D. If you look at how a profit-maximizing um, company would respond to these changes in um, user costs, the net effect on capital by sector would look something like this. Larger increases for structures and rental residential, a large decline um, for R&D, and on net, the capital stock in the long run would rise by 3%. And we have a lot of details in our paper. You can read things like endogenizing um, choices about debt, endogenizing a shift between the corporate um, and non-corporate sectors, their relative tax rates um, change, and the like. What this means for growth is that in the long run, GDP would be 0.9% higher than it would otherwise be. Um, after 10 years, assuming the economy converges to steady state at 5% a year, which is a little bit higher than the standard you would have in the growth literature, but about the midpoint of where estimates have been in the tax literature, you get the economy would be 0.4% higher. That's four basis points a year on um, the growth rate. And then to do the case that is my preferred case, uh, but certainly was not my co-author's preferred case, um, with crowd out, you would get um, in interest rates not up a whole lot, um, up f um, 14 basis points, and cuts the growth effect roughly um, in half. Our growth estimates are pretty similar to others. I didn't actually um, cherry pick this next picture to put us right in the middle. Um, but if you look at TPC, JCT, CBO, and Penn Wharton, um, some of the other places that have um, big comprehensive models, they all have similar annual growth rates um, to what we find. And obviously, everyone falls well short of what you would need um, to pay for it. So that's everything presented in terms of GDP. As I said, we ran out of time and didn't get to national income. And I think that's a shame because that's what people really um, should be looking at. Um, for those of you that don't know what national income is, is it takes GDP, it adds in the net income you get from the rest of the world from cross-border payments. It subtracts out depreciation. So if the, a bunch of your GDP is just replacing machines that you already have, and if your growth is coming from a lot of extra machines, more of your GDP is going to go to replace those machines. That's not something anyone can spend um, or enjoy. And then there's a statistical um, discrepancy. So national income is a better measure of you know, how Americans are doing what possibilities they have for the resources produced by the country after repaying foreigners and rebuilding the depreciating um, machines. National income used to be the standard thing that um, people would report. If you look at Alta et al. and the AER in 2001, they reported all their results in terms of national income. You look at the Treasury dynamic analysis of the tax panel in 2007, I think it was, they report everything um, in terms of national income. I think that's something we should all um, be going back to. And going back to, because a lot of these policies result in a systematic difference between the effect on GDP than national income. One is insofar as you're getting your growth from a lot of additional capital, you get a lot more depreciation. Insofar as you get more investment, that needs to be financed from somewhere. And if the tax cuts aren't paid for, um, deficits also need to be financed from somewhere. To show what this might have looked like, the 0.4 increase in um, GDP growth could end up being something more like a 0.1% increase in national income. And this just comes from saying, um, Investment is up about 5% of GDP cumulatively over the decade. The deficit is up about, the debt is up about 10% of GDP cumulatively over the decade. So that extra 15% cumulative over 10 years of a difference between savings and investment, if one third of that comes from abroad and you finance that, 
at a plausible rate of return, the um, net income that you're paying to the rest of the world changes. And notice that's a really small change in net income. Net income now, um, our foreign payments are, we get 1.1% of GDP from the rest of the world. This just changes it to 0 0.9. So you're not talking about some huge, massive crowding out you'd notice, uh, but it is quite large relative to the 0 0.4. And if you assume we're repaying foreigners at the same rate of return that we're getting on our investment, um, the sign actually flips. So the effect on GDP is positive, the effect on national income is negative, and that's again under a set of reasonably plausible assumptions that one third of the new borrowing for the additional investment is financed from abroad and repaid at the same rate of return um, as that um, investment. Um, I don't intend these to be definitive estimates, but just encouragement that we all try to move towards making that the, the headline number that we focus on like we did in the past. Um, the next um, topic is welfare. In a room of tax nerds, there's n everyone understands that the welfare effects of taxation, which is our word for well-being and how it affects people, are different from just the cash. So um, the cash matters. You get a direct tax cut. You get $100. You have $100 more. Um, you get a raise from your employer. You make more money. So those are all welfare benefits. Um, but you also want to take into account how you got those benefits in the first place. They didn't just materialize from nowhere. Um, one way you got them is by borrowing. And so you got $100 today of a tax cut. But you also got an IOU that you or your children or someone at some point is going to need to repay, and that has a cost to you. You might have worked harder for that extra money, and so you have less leisure, and you might have reduced your consumption in order to s generate more capital in order to live better um, in the future. And for some of these, um, the time difference is different. So if you look at just the long-run growth impact, you're looking at what you get you know, 40 years from now when the reduction in consumption today happens sooner than that. And when you're comparing the two, um, you don't want to just look at the steady state and think it materialized from nowhere. It came from somewhere. Um, and that somewhere is going to be foreign borrowing, domestic borrowing, um, reduced consumption, and um, and the like. Um, welfare effects can be larger or smaller than the headline for something like um, reducing the tax benefit for health insurance. The welfare benefits are probably larger than what you would measure in terms of economic growth or dollars. For things that rely heavily on extra work or extra savings to generate their benefits, the welfare effects will be um, smaller than some of the headline numbers. Now, this is a complicated concept to convey, but there's a lot of simpler things we can do um, to better convey it, I think. One is just continually remind people of this point. Second is report aggregates that are a little bit closer to the concept of welfare than GDP is. So national income would be there. It adjusts for part of what you care about. Consumption instead of output is another way, because ultimately what you're trying to do is boost consumption. And when we're working with micro-founded models, they have welfare built into them. We can um, report that. These are all at a macroeconomic level. Um, this matters particularly at a microeconomic level and how it gets distributed um, across people. And there's a number of things we can do there, um, too. One is, as Greg Leiserson has pointed out, distribution tables for revenue neutral changes are showing you welfare, because at least for um, rational agents, they were already at a local optimum. The envelope theorem says that any change you make in behavior in response to a tax cut, for example, working more and earning more income, is something um, that at the margin, is the benefit of that is second order of reducing that distortion. And the distribution table gives you the first order changes um, you'd really want to know. I'm looking at distributional tables with financing, which Bill Gale has been um, doing for at least 17 years now, maybe longer. And then um, Doug Elmendorf um, 
Bill Gale, myself, um, and Ben, I think, did something on dynamic distributional analysis a while ago, and that's a way of breaking out each of these separately and showing you know, what the direct tax change is, what the extra wages are, but also what's the cost of foregone leisure, the cost of financing, and showing how all of those um, fit together. So continuing um, this whirlwind tour, I wanted to talk next about you know, how we'll know whether the tax cut had a huge impact on growth, a medium impact on growth, and a small impact on growth. One way to know is to do these types of ex-ante models that I've been talking about. I actually think we're not necessarily going to be able to improve on that, that you, know, you look at what you think ought to happen if businesses are rationally responding to the new incentives, and that's what you think will happen, regardless of what happens um, in the data. The second thing is you could refer to the wisdom of crowds. And the wisdom of crowds is that the growth rate in 2018 looks a lot higher than what had been expected um, before the tax cuts passed and before um, Trump was in office. The CBO upward revision um, was notably large. Um, I'm also by the way, not to bash CBO, but I'm, I would be happy to take the under on their forecast of 3.3% growth um, for 2018, if anyone wants to take the other side of that. Um, the um, question is, why did this get revised? Um, partly this is because of the tax cuts. Um, as I said, just about any model would find a boost to growth from the tax cuts in 2018. <laughs> but a large part of it is also a boost to global growth. And if you look at the IMF forecasts from just before the U.S. election for the year 2017, um, uh, relative to what actually happened in 2017, it was revised up everywhere, uh, revised up less for the United States than it was for most of the other economies um, in the world. So clearly more is going on here than um, just tax cuts. And the most important question is what do the tax cuts do not for you know, expanding demand in the short run, but for expanding supply and the potential rate of growth in the medium and long run. Um, and there, at least so far, the verdict of forecasters appears to be that the tax cuts, plus whatever else has changed in their view of the world um, over the last year, is the medium-term outlook is about the same as what it was, um, if anything, um, it, some forecasters have lowered their outlook for potential over the next 10 years. Um, again, that's the, a combination of the tax cut, change in understanding, other changes in policies over the last year. Um, you can try to look at the um, macro data, and a lot of the debate was over wages, and in particular, would wages rise by $4,000 to $9,000, or would you get some number um, smaller than that? Um, it's obviously a little bit early to tell, um, but the blue line is nominal wages. You certainly don't see a discontinuity in January. Um, inflation has continued to rise, so if anything, real wage growth has fallen. So um, at the very least, some of the stories that corporations are going to very rapidly share the tax cut um, with workers are not refuted by this, but at least cast into doubt. Um, I should say there's a lot of models. You know, if I ask, you know, my, uh, you know, Marty Feldstein or Greg Mankiw, they'll tell you the pass through takes time. And I think that's a perfectly reasonable model. In the political debate, some people acted as if the tax cuts would go to workers right away. Um, that doesn't seem to be happening. There's a lot of different um, forward-looking measures of investment. None of them are you know, particularly um, great, but if you look at them, you probably can't even read what those all are, um, just about every one, whether you're looking at new orders of capital goods, looking at the ISM, a whole bunch of um, Federal Reserve banks do diffusion indices of intent to invest over the next six months. Morgan Stanley has one. Most of those started rising in 2016. Very few of those do you see any sort of discontinuous continuity or change, of, uh, change in the rate of change during the tax debate. And if anything, most of them have leveled out or fallen 
since um, January. Again, I would not infer the, anything about the story I was telling in the paper with Robert about what happens 10 years from now and in the long term from three months of data, um, but there are an awful lot of people pointing to these types of indices as proof that the tax cuts are working, and I squinted a lot, and I'm having a hard time seeing them working in those numbers. Um, if you look at uh, business investment, there's a lot of different factors that influence it. One of the big ones is the increase in the price of oil has caused um, a big increase in oil investment following the opposite in previous years. If you look at business fixed investment excluding oil, which are the set of things on the right hand side, um, you do see some pickup in um, the first quarter. Um, the question is, you know, what to make of that? And the most important thing to make of it is precisely nothing either way. Um, this shows you the deviation from the mean for investment over um, on an annual basis for investment growth. The CBO forecast is that red line there. 45% of the outcomes just from purely random variation are above the CBO forecast. 55% are below. And so if you're trying to look at one year of data, it's a little bit like somebody has the hypothesis that a coin was rigged, and instead of being a fair coin is 55-45, and they give you one coin toss. And based on that one coin toss, you have to decide whether or not um, you think that coin is rigged. And in fact, it's even worse than one coin toss of a slightly rigged coin, because you're not really even quite sure what um, heads and tails are. This is centered around zero, but you don't quite know what investment should have been. So you don't even really know whether you're above what you thought it was going to be um, or below what you thought it was going to be. Um, and finally, even if somebody came down from on high and told you, here is the exact macro impact causal of the tax cuts in 2018, you couldn't infer anything um, about the long term. Um, it might be a large effect in 2018 that would fade over time. No, or it might be a small effect in 2018 because it would take time for businesses um, to make decisions and grow. So I think all of the arguing over the macroeconomic data um, is mostly going to be people embarrassing themselves. Um, the 10-year growth rate is the same type of story. There's a lot of variation in what can happen in the 10-year growth rate. Most of the um, plausible estimates out there you wouldn't really see. Um, CEA's upper bound of half a point a year is something that you might be able to see that signal a little bit um, from the noise. So I want to um, end with um, what's next. I think, um, first of all, the good news for anyone who either didn't love this law or loves having lots of tax reform and loves having lots of forums at places like this, is there's tons of instability in the tax code. There's the extenders, the backloaded offsets, the expirations, the whole individual side going away, the economic instability of high deficits, the political instability of lack of bipartisan buy-in. So we'll have a lot to talk about, all of us, um, for years to come. Um, I think tax reform is needed more than ever. Revenue is the biggest thing. Um, the whole reason we have a tax code is because we need revenue for something. If you wanted to get rid of distortions entirely from the tax code, the easiest thing would be just to set all rates to zero. Um, we don't do that because we think there's a set of important things government does. Um, right now, we're not funding the set of things that we've chosen to do. I think there's issues with progressivity, efficiency, um, simplicity, and then, as I said before, the stability of the tax code. I've talked about four general principles for thinking about what to do going forward. One is a stable tax code, which is stable in two senses. The provisions are permanent, not phasing in and out. And it's fiscally sustainable um, as well. The second is that it's efficient. And there's a lot of ways um, going forward to improve the tax base while raising the rates. So the mantra of the tax community has always been broader base, lower rates. I think it's pretty hard to raise the revenue we want with that. I mean, there's some base broadenings that a lot of us would support. There's either political obstacles or even revenue limits to taking them to the extreme. So I think part of what we need to worry about is how can we raise rates and do it um, in the most efficient model. Um, simplicity shouldn't be about the number of lines on the tax form, but about whether you need to fill out the tax form um, in the first place and what you can do 
um, for working um, families. So just to end where I began with a little bit of macro um, analysis, I wanted to compare the laws written, which was the analysis I showed you, with another case Robert and I had, provisions permanent, and then another sensitivity analysis we showed, which is the 28% tax rate, so raising the tax rate, but moving to full expensing and disallowing the interest deduction. Um, both of those, making everything in the law permanent or the higher rates um, better base, would reduce the cost of capital, but the cost of capital would go down a lot more with the higher rates um, better base. And what's notable about that is those, to get the blue bars, you need to spend about $500 billion. To get the orange bars, you'd raise about $500 billion. So of these two reforms compared to each other, making everything permanent costs money and does less for reducing effective tax rates than a higher tax rate, a better base, um, which also raises money. And if you look at the impact on growth, you would get about an extra, less than an extra one-tenth of a percent a year from making everything permanent. You could get more than two-tenths a year on the growth rate from, um, um, from this, this alternative type of reform. And you do it while raising money, whereas with the former, you would end up costing money, going deeper into deficit, and having um, more crowding out. So I'm confident that if next time all we do is report everything in terms of national income, show welfare analysis for everything, um, we'll end up with the second plan instead of the first one. Thank you. So, so I can't remember how much time I have, but whatever time I have, I have. OK, great. Yeah. And I think people are probably supposed to identify themselves. Hi, Steve Rosenthal, Tax Policy Center. Uh, last month, the CBO uh, issued a, a revised report um, showing GDP growth at, I think, something like 0.5% and GNP at 0.1%. Uh, is that consistent with what you're finding? It looked, according to press reports and Senator Van Hollen, as if foreigners uh, reaped a large share of uh, the difference. Uh, and again, uh, you criticized CBO a little earlier as, you know, in terms of the, the size of their estimates, but it seems roughly comparable to what you're saying here, or what yeah. are you saying? Oh, sorry. I, my, I think CBO's estimate of the tax law itself is perfectly reasonable and is similar to my estimates of the tax law itself. <laughs> they have a 3.3 estimate for GDP in 20. Um, 18, which they explain, I think it was like 0 0.3 or 0 0.5 was from the tax law. I thought that was fine. It might even have been too small an effect of the tax law in that year. But it's all the other things going on in their macro model that have nothing to do with the tax debate, I think, led them to have a higher forecast that made sense. And just to do it in your own head, you know, 3.3 takes symmetric errors. What are the odds growth this year really ends up being above 4? what are the odds growth this year ends up being 2.6 or less? I think those aren't, don't have equal odds. Um, on the GDP GNP thing, yeah, no, that's, that's pretty similar. And again, you know, to get a large difference between the GDP and the GNP, and for those of you that don't know, GNP is like national income, but it doesn't subtract depreciation um, and the statistical discrepancy. Uh, the, you know, to get a large difference in GDP and GNP doesn't take a lot because the GDP estimates aren't that big. And so even relatively small amounts of changes in foreign financing uh, matter. And, and the last thing I'd say, by the way, is you know, if you had to rank your outcomes for the world, the best is if you have a lot of additional capital here and we don't need to repay foreigners. The second best is a lot of additional capital here and we do need to repay foreigners. The worst is no additional capital here. So I wouldn't sneeze at the importance of GDP. It's just that it can systematically you know, overstate what's going on, especially when there's other costs. Yeah. yeah Victor. Victor Taroni. So um, I guess my question is um, how much you're looking at the longer run effects versus the one-time um, wealth effects of the change. And um, a couple of those effects would be that we gave away a lot of money 
to foreigners, and so to me that reduces our national welfare. The question is maybe is how much is that? And then we gave a lot of money away to wealthy people, and then from the welfare point of view, that would reduce, you know, social welfare. So maybe you could comment on that. Thanks. Right. So I didn't do anything in this talk about distribution, and there's a lot of distributional tables um, out there, and, and TPC has done a lot of work on that. So on your second, absolutely, I think looking at distributional tables matters um, a lot. That wasn't really as much my subject. On the first, um, yeah, that would show up basically in the difference between GDP and national income, because the, what national income records is the fact that, yes, you're producing more in the United States, but more of your production in the United States is devoted to repaying foreigners because they now have a stock of the wealth that they didn't used to. So I think that's picked up there. Yeah. Oh, I think a microphone's making its way. Um, thanks for your interesting presentation. Um, Eric Toder, Tax Policy Center. Um, you, you said the, the analysis we do of supply side effects, which is the central core of the growth, things take five or ten years to materialize mostly. So what we'll, we'll see, uh, you know, the effects of this five or ten years from now. Today we're seeing the effect of tax legislation that was um, uh, passed over the previous five years, including the, the bonus depreciation. It's also true that part of this is bringing in capital from overseas, but when foreign countries cut their corporate tax rates, it, it causes capital to move in the other direction, so there are supply side effects due to other countries' policies. So my question is, how do you sort this out in any way that makes sense so that anybody can argue that any particular action did anything? It just seems like there's so much going on. For, look, first of all, most of economic policy is like that. There's lots of different stuff going on, and it's really hard to sort it out. Uh, I think in some ways it's a little bit easier to do here because we at least have some idea of some of the relevant elasticities and assumptions that businesses are rational profit maximizers, probably closer to a reasonable assumption to make for a business over the medium and long run than it is um, at the individual level. I think the best estimates come from some reasonable set of parameters estimated in other contexts, and then you apply those parameters to this um, particular law. We'll get a lot of micro research that finds, you know, this company sitting here didn't get the law for some reason, that one did, look at the difference between them. I think that will be useful, but my guess is none of that will answer the macro question because it'll help elucidate you know, partial equilibrium versions of particular provisions rather than the general equilibrium effect um, of the law as a whole. I think the macro data and looking at the actual is useful not for testing the serious, you know, the view that a serious proponent would have, but many of the arguments made in the political system were not the most serious arguments, and I think the macro data is useful for testing that. And you know, when a top White House economic advisor says we're going to easily get 4% growth this year, we're going to have a test of that, and we will see whether that prediction was right um, you know, or wrong. I don't think that answers whether the tax cut was a good or a bad um, idea. So I guess I don't know what to do other than all of this. And then finally, on the things going across borders, we basically don't have that in our model, except insofar as the tax rate is lower here, so more capital um, comes here, but we don't have anything from beat, guilty, et cetera. And I know Aparna, I think, thinks she's figured it out. Maybe you have, um, but I think it's hideously too complicated for even Aparna or anyone else um, to figure out. So, yeah. Uh, Heather Long from the Washington Post. Uh, on capital spending, I'm curious if you could clarify uh, when you think we'll start to see some impacts. And I'm also curious to get your take. Uh, we just had the S&P 500 earnings the past few weeks. Two phenomena stood out, record buybacks uh, from shares. But also, uh, there was a big jump, at least among S&P 500 companies, in capital spending year over year. So can we read anything uh, from the capital spending or share buybacks? 
Right. Um, so first of all, in terms of capital spending, there are three reason, four reasons you'd expect it to go up. One is it was unusually low in the years following the financial crisis. And you tend to have capital booms followed by busts and busts followed by booms. And so most forecasters in 2016 were expecting it to rise. And in fact, if you look at a variety of measures of capital spending, they started to rise um, in 2016. Second, the oil price increase results in an increase in capital spending. Third, the Keynesian side of this, of just increased demand through an accelerator model. Um, and then finally, the incentive part of this, which is investments that didn't used to be profitable at a lower tax rate now would be. Um, so you have all four of those going on at once. The tax law is primarily about the fourth, and you're trying to infer the fourth um, from, from all of them. As I said, I think, you know, it's sort of hopeless to do this because there's just so much noise in the overall investment series and the signal we're trying to extract out of this is really small relative to that noise. So I just would discourage anyone from trying to read too much um, into the tea leaves. Certainly you can read into the tea leaves that, you know, it's not like all $2.5 trillion that was repatriated went into business investment in the first quarter. Like, we can rule that out. Um, the, um, yeah, but I would expect investment um, to be going up. In fact, if anything, I'm surprised that, you know, when the Federal Reserve Banks survey their companies in their districts, fewer of those companies are saying they're increasing their investment over the next six months than we're saying it before. I find that surprising. I would have expected that to go up. Yeah. Oh. Hey, J <coughs> Jason Frank, Clement Americans for Tax Fairness. Uh, so we actually were just did a table last night looking at uh, what I call the revenue gap. Um, and when you were in the Obama administration, you got hammered an awful lot for, uh, you know, perhaps the deficit being too high. Now we're looking at 6% uh, of GDP as opposed to 3% of GDP where Republicans used to be in terms of the types of deficits that they were uh, willing to accommodate. <coughs> so over the next 10 years, taking the CBO numbers, if you allow for a deficit of 3% of GDP, we're short about $4.8 trillion. If you allow for a 4% deficit, we're short about $2.3 trillion. So that's short just to keep the government going as it's projected to go with the baby boomers retiring, either 2.3 or 4.8, depending on what, what <laughs> percentage point you're willing to allow. And then on top of that, one could say, you know, we probably need $2 trillion of new investments, infrastructure, child care, health care, education, things like that. And so I'm you know, putting your political hat on, thinking about people running for office in 2012, or 2020, sorry. Uh, you know, kind of where do you think, where do we need, what kind of revenue you put, you put some proposals forward as ways to raise revenue. I'm just kind of wondering in a macro sense, how much revenue do you think we need to be raising over the next 10 years you know, to, to put the deficit as a share of GDP where you think it ought to be and to make the kinds of investments we need to make? Yeah, look, I mean, I think if, if someone ran with the slogan, um, better base, higher rate, they might, might like get a plurality of voters in this room. Um, <laughs> And like about the same number nationwide. So um, I don't really know. I know what we should be doing, and I think that's what we should be aiming for um, in the tax system. I have no idea how people should talk about it. Um, and I think we have one minute if somebody has an incredibly short question. Um, otherwise, uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Harris. I'm a visiting uh, associate professor with uh, Kellogg School of Management. Um, let me start off by saying a few, a few thank yous. One, thank you to Jason for coming down from Boston and keynoting this. Uh, I spent a lot of my career listening to you talk about taxes. I always find it interesting. Today is no different. Uh, second is thank you to the Tax Policy Center for partnering with Kellogg. This is the third event this year, as Mark mentioned at the beginning. The first two were were held out uh, at, at Northwestern. 
Um, I'm an alum of the Tax Policy Center, but now currently a professor at Kellogg. And so it's sort of a treat to me to be able to sort of invite all my really smart friends from Tax Policy Center, Mark Mazur, Donald Marin, um, uh, Adam Looney, uh, Gene Sturley to come out to, to Kellogg and speak. And it was incredibly, uh, I think, insightful for the Kellogg community. It was a, it was a sort of standing room only event um, uh, for the for the for the students, and so it was terrific. And so this is, I think, continuing as Mark said, a terrific tradition of of partnership. Um, and third, let me just say, sort of a thank you to Tax Policy Center for the role you've played over the past year and a half. Uh, when I left the Obama administration, I went to go work for a hedge fund and then, and then transitioned to uh, uh, being a professor at Kellogg. Very different roles for me. The one thing that didn't change is that I went to Tax Policy Center's website every single day. And I just want to say sort of publicly that I think the role you've played in informing the public and informing academics about tax policy is incredibly important. So, so thank you for that. Um, now let me turn the presentation and say a little bit about the motivation behind uh, this presentation which precedes a paper by me and Adam Looney, which will hopefully be released later today or maybe tomorrow. Um, Adam and I started writing, writing this paper with the motivation to say, uh, look, this isn't, this isn't as pro-growth a tax plan as it could have been. And we quickly realized that wasn't really helpful. Uh, what would have been more helpful would be to talk about ways that if and when Congress revisits tax, uh, tax reform, what can be some, some guiding ways forward. And, and this is not, what I'm about to lay out is not a tax reform plan. It's the idea, to be, the idea is to be a first step in a constructive conversation. So if we think this is like 1981, where President Reagan came, uh, came into office, passed a really steep tax cut, which uh, was quickly shown to be unsustainable and was followed up by a series of other tax cuts and eventually 1986 tax reform, well, what would you have done in 1981? You'd want to contribute to the debate in a constructive, helpful way. So that's the idea behind this paper and this presentation. Uh, it's not to necessarily say uh, that this, this plan wasn't as, as pro-growth as it could have been. Uh, like Jason's presentation, we stay away from distributional estimates. That's really important. I thought Jason's point about welfare was, is also critical and something we probably don't do enough. Of, but, but TPC and others have done a great job showing the distributional effects of the tax plan. Um, so we stay away from that and, and stick mostly to issues surrounding growth. Um, uh, you know, and the third comment is, is that I think the tax policy world, or at least, at least me, is still digesting this tax plan. Um, you know, maybe you understand all the international provisions perfectly, but I mean, we're seeing states are still responding to this. You saw what happened with New York and the SALT. Uh, so the world is still digesting this tax plan, and include me as, as one of those people who's still digesting it. Um, so in some ways, this is a little preliminary. Um, with that, uh, so I'll just go over the overview about what I'm going to talk about today for the next half an hour or so. Uh, the first, I'll talk about characterizing what's in TCJA uh, for individuals and businesses. Then talk about what are the impact on taxpayers and the economy. Third, I'll talk about is this a lasting tax plan? Uh, Jason brought, brought up the points about why it's not a, a lasting tax plan, and I agree with those. Um, but if not, what's next? And most importantly, if and when Congress does revisit tax cuts or tax reform, however you want to characterize it, uh, how can this be improved? So what's in the TCJ for businesses? I think many of us know what's in it, but let me say, I think it's incredibly important to characterize this tax cut in the right way. It's not enough to turn to a reporter or to turn to the public and say, um, so this tax plan has 104 different points, and uh, you, know, you, can, you can look in a JCT publication and find it. It's really important we characterize this in the right way. It's really important that we communicate what's in the tax plan in the right way. So, Adam and I tried to distill this down to 11 main points, uh, five main points for businesses, and six main points for individuals. Um, so if I'm sort of explaining this to my in-laws, how, how do I talk about this? Um, and you know, I think the first, the first, the centerpiece of this tax plan is clearly a massive cut in the corporate tax rate, something which has been elusive for, for decades, a cut from 35% to 21%. It's one of the few permanent aspects in this tax code, um, and so I think you have to sort of lead with that. Second, we have temporary expensing uh, for certain types of investments, uh, but we get this somewhat uh, disjointed uh, schedule of expiration over the next 10 years. 
the international form, something I'm still digesting very much, um, but was, I think, one of the most consequential aspects of this reform. Uh, a shift to sort of a modified territorial system, uh, the imposition of a minimum tax on intangible income, an anti-base erosion tax through the beat, and then uh, a transition tax with deemed repatriation. Um, the fourth main component of this tax plan is a sort of a complicated deduction for pass-throughs. Uh, costs almost half a trillion dollars in lost revenue. Um, uh, and I'll leave it at that. And then the last is that we get limited base broadening. And I haven't seen a terrific analysis of how the base will change, particularly how it will change year by year. Maybe that's a future research project for TPC. But um, this is a really important point, right? So you know, we heard, everyone knows the, the mantra that a broader base uh, is so important. I don't think we entirely understand what this means for base broadening, particularly in a dynamic sense. So that's sort of a summary of what's in the TCJA for businesses, what's in the TCJA I'm not sure this would work. All right, so my presentation's over, I think. Um, am I doing this? There are two arrows, I'm pushing one of them, I think. Oh, so what's in the TCJ for individuals? Uh, obviously, temporary lower rates through 2025 and permanent indexing. I think the permanent indexing part is really important and something that hasn't, uh, that hasn't necessarily uh, made it out into the public quite yet. Uh, temporary cha changes to family benefits, uh, including the swap between the larger standard deduction and the uh, elimination of personal exemptions, coupled with a larger child tax credit. Uh, temporary limits on itemized deductions, the mortgage interest, the SALT, uh, miscellaneous deductions. Uh, a temporary AMT fix, which is really big. This is another part which ha probably hasn't gotten enough play in the popular press. Uh, we'll get to that in a minute. Uh, the fifth major component for individuals is permanent elimination of the mandate penalty. Um, maybe because we've been talking about uh, health insurance so much over the past year and a half that I think that has gotten a fair amount of attention. And then a temporary doubling of the uh, estate tax exemption. So that's how Adam and I characterize the sort of 11 main points. But um, this is a really complicated bill. It's tough to characterize, but I think it's important that we get this right so people understand exactly what's in it. So what's the main impact on taxpayers or tax pay? Not, not the economic impact, but sort of the, uh, uh, the characteristics of, uh, of taxpayers. One, lower income tax rates, um, that's obvious. The, uh, the change to itemizing is really stark. And um, I think that most people in this room might understand that we have 27 million fewer itemizers uh, somewhat fewer payers of the income tax due to the larger, uh, well, due to a host of factors, including uh, the larger, well, a lot of things are interacting, but we have fewer payers of income tax. Uh, for married couples, itemizing is basically dead. So um, we would have expected in 2018, these are TPC estimates, in 2018, we would have expected about one out of every two, about half of married couples uh, filing jointly to itemize, 44%. That, that's dropped down to 16%. So for married couples, you basically went from it being common to being fairly rare. Uh, other filing statuses are still low, but they didn't start out nearly as high as the married filing jointly. So that's, that's a big change for itemizers. Um, what else is happening on the AMT? So the AMT is, when I talk about it, one of the worst design taxes you could possibly imagine. You would never design a tax to tax uh, uh, high, high tax paying large families. Um, but that's exactly what the AMT did. But the AMT is basically dead. I mean, we went from 5.2 million uh, in 2018 down to 200,000. And I was, I was so surprised by this that I actually called up Adam and said, is this right? It seems like there's a typo in a TPC table. But I mean, the AMT is basically dead. And the characteristics of those taxpayers is different. So the remaining 200,000 are kind of these idiosyncratic cases. It's not the cases we used to see where it was basically large families in California and New York. Um, that's sort of a gross overgeneralization, but the point is the AMT is basically dead, and, and this is something which I think has been a goal of uh, tax reform for a long time. Fewer taxable estates, uh, I don't think this gets quite enough play. Um, you know, it was interesting, the other day at the National Tax Association meeting, which was last week, there was this great question. 
where someone asked the panel, they said, is this a populist tax cut? And everyone sort of thought, and you know, I think one person sort of mentioned something about a change to, uh, to immigration. It was really minor. I mean, this is not a ta populist tax cut. This is a huge tax cut to the estate tax. This is a windfall gain for foreign investors. Um, a, you know, and I think that, that the lack of attention to what's happened on the estate tax is representative of that. Um, uh, and then also, so the last, uh, the last big impact, there's no penalty for not obtaining health insurance. Um, those are all short-term effects. Those are all sort of through 2025 effects. Uh, over the long term, the big trade-off is just a permanent massive cut in the corporate tax cut rate uh, in exchange for higher statutory rates due to chain CPI. That's the big trade-off in the long term. Um, and so that's how I'd characterize the main impact on, on individual taxpayers. Uh, what are the main ep uh, economic effects? Jason summarized these. Uh, so it was a large temporary stimulus. Um, and that's driving a lot of the growth impacts in the, in the short term. Uh, we saw mar a moderate cuts in marginal rates on capital and labor, about two percentage points throughout the budget window. It's a little higher around 2020, 2021, a little bit less afterwards. Uh, the capital rates, uh, the, the cuts in marginal tax rates on capital persist throughout the budget window. At the end, we're still talking about about 1.5 percentage point cut. They pretty obviously reverse for labor with the expiration of the lower rates on income um, and actually are higher at the end of the budget window um, than they would have been in the absence of the tax cut. Um, uh, higher deficits and importantly higher projected uh, interest rates. Uh, 2018 through 2020, the deficit is projected to be $1.8 billion higher, uh, sorry, $1.8 trillion higher, that's a typo. Uh, and this has broken down 1.3 trillion in net the primary deficit and 600 billion additional in interest payments. Um, you never want to attribute anything specifically to anything else, uh, particularly if you're sort of this is sort of a correlation here. But just pointing out that you know CBO projected uh, about a 30 basis point increase in the 10 year in the near term. We're already up. Again, not saying it's causal, but just saying we're up uh, 66 basis points since passage as of a few days ago in the 10 years. So um, there's a cha chance that that, was, that, was, that projection was undershot. Um, and then we get a moderate short-term boost in output produced within the U.S. borders. Jason talked about this, uh, but almost a zero boost to, to U.S. incomes. Um, uh, and so J Jason covered that, so I won't, won't talk about that. But I think that's important. Uh, when we're talking about the sort of well-being for Americans. This, this tax cut boosted investment. Um, it's almost impossible to have such a steep cut in the corporate tax rate and not, and not have that happen. But I think it, it's, it's more nuanced than saying this is sort of a pro-investment tax cut. Investment fared really, really differently. Um, and this is, this is drawn from CBO's uh, uh, write-up in its latest budget and economic outlook, which, by the way, is, is outstanding, Appendix B. Um, I think a lot of people in this room might spend a lot of time in CBO appendices, myself included, but it's a really good write-up and I recommend it as a way of understanding what's going on. Um, but as you see, I mean, this is, this is a, a big increase in, these are so billions on the, uh, on the y-axis, a big increase in equipment investment, a moderate increase in non-residential structures driven by, uh, that's almost entirely driven by the lower corporate tax rate doesn't fare particularly well for IP, and I'm not sure that's the, the trend we want in 2018, given what we're expecting uh, to happen with uh, the economy moving forward, and not good at all for residential investment. And so um, I don't think the story's been told particularly well. Uh, you know, it's, we're going to see a drop in investment in home ownership. I'm not sure that was intended. I'm not sure what, that's what taxpayers wanted. Um, we did get a big boost in, in equipment, according to CBO, and in non-residential structures. But it's not enough to call this a pro-investment tax cut. It's more nuanced than that. Investment fared really differently in this, in this bill. Is this a stable tax plan? No, it's not a stable tax plan. Uh, for a lot of the reasons that, that, that Jason mentioned, a lot of the provisions explicitly expire. And this, uh, you know, with the Bush tax cuts in 2001, we eventually got to the point where they all sort of expired at midnight on uh, 2010. And I think a lot of the people in the tax policy community were sort of looking to that as an opportunity to improve the tax code. Because of where we are in the business cycle at the end of 2010, it was extended by two years with some other changes. 
Um, the provisions uh, expire in, in this, uh, in sort of a bizarre, uh, maybe not bizarre, but non uh, uniform way. A lot of the individual side expires at, at 2025, but certain other aspects expire earlier. But that adds to the lack of stability in the tax plan. Um, key international provisions may not survive challenges from our trading partners. Uh, if some of those go away, we're going to have to revisit the international side. I have no idea. I don't pretend to be an expert on WTO policy, but people who understand that far better than I say there's a very good chance that, that those will not survive the challenge. Um, and the fundamental tax structure is out of line with spending. Jason noted that that's why we have a tax plan in the first place, which is to raise spending that Americans want and expect. Uh, if it's fundamentally out of whack for too long, it's not doing what it was intended to do. And that's what you see. Uh, we're just not raising enough revenues for the, the spending that Americans have been promised. Um, on the tax policy aspect with respect to stability, it's kind of a mixed bag. So we have some new tax expenditures, the, uh, the new tax expenditure for pass-throughs and uh, the FIDI. Um, we have some scale backs and other tax expenditures, but there's sort of trade-offs. We're sort of unclear how, how that will interact in the economy. We're, it's unclear how Americans will feel about that. Uh, it's unclear how Americans will feel about scaled back itemized deductions. So um, I think that sort of adds to the lack of stability in the tax plan. One way or another, we're going to have to revisit this. Even if it's just an extension, we're going to revisit this. And so again, the motivation for this exercise for me and Adam was trying to be a constructive part of that debate and to start it early. Um, so how will this play out? And I, I really only see sort of five different potential ways. So if we get to 2025, let's say, or, or 2028, and we sort of do a post-mortem and say, what happened? Um, I think we have five explanations. One could be everything we knew about public finance was wrong, and this was a pro-growth tax cut. Uh, it boosted investment in labor supply substantially, uh, increased efficiency and compliance, and it, all, it grew the economy and mostly paid for itself without having an increase in deficit. That, that's one, I don't think that's where we're going to be, but that's a possibility. What's, what's not an option is to say everything we knew about pu public finance was right and we got all these terrific outcomes. That, that's not an option. Um, but it may be that, look, economists have been getting this stuff wrong for a long time and this turned out far better than we thought. A second option would be that everything we suspected about debt was wrong uh, and the growing debt and rising projected debt never really impacted the economy. My little snarky comment about the 10-year treasuries didn't really matter. Um, and we can just continue giving these large tax cuts and just doesn't, it just doesn't matter. I mean, maybe Dick Cheney was right and it doesn't matter. Or maybe it's, we're nowhere near being the threshold where it matters. Um, and this tax, code kinda, this tax cut did what it did without having the negative impacts we thought it might. Uh, a third possible option is that uh, we were right about tepid growth and deficits. And when I say we, I'm sort of using collectively everyone, the, all the people that, that Jason just showed, but you know, not just uh, Robert and Jason, but CBO, uh, Tax Policy Center, uh, Penn Wharton budget model, all projected fairly tepid growth. So we were maybe right about tepid growth and deficits, um, but Congress used this as an opportunity to pare back spending. You know, maybe they did starve the beast. And you know, we get to 2028 and there's been serious reforms to Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. I think that the, that the context of this tax cut will look very different. A fourth potential um, scenario in retrospect is say, look, we were right about tep tepid growth and deficits, but Congress, Congress eventually had to go back to what happened in the early 80s and jack up uh, tax revenues to pay for a, a cut that was too steep in the first place. Um, and just to be clear, this cut is nowhere near as steep as the 1981 tax cut, but that might be a, another scenario. Um, a fifth scenario is we were right about tepid growth and deficits, and this just expires on schedule, and we kind of go back to where we were, but we're just an extra $2 trillion in debt. I don't really see a sixth option. Um, I think these are the five things, if you look retrospectively, uh, that will sort of explain the, the, the tax cut. Um, uh, obviously, number one is the best scenario, maybe not for economists, but for the country, but I, think it's, I don't think it's particularly likely. And so now to get to the motivation strategies for the next round. And these are really, these are strategies. That, again, this is not a tax plan, uh, but these are some of the lessons that, uh, from the public finance literature as far as what 
Congress could do if it was interested in boosting welfare, if it was interested in boosting uh, investment and labor supply, and some of these strategies that were not really incorporated all that well in the last tax cut. Um, the first is to tax old capital and provide incentives for new investment. I'll get to each one of these in turn. Uh, maybe I'll just go, go to them. Um, so I think this is probably one of the most important observations that we had in our paper, which is that uh, a tax plan should not should, should tax old capital and provide incentives for new investment. The TCGA provided a massive windfall for already committed capital. Right? So if you had already bought that, that stock, if you had already built that factory, this is a great tax plan for you because you're just going to pay, you're just going to see your after-tax profits go up uh, indefinitely because of the permanent change in the corporate tax rate. That's a really bad way to incent new growth is giving someone uh, some sort of benefit for something that's already been done, right? So the strategy has to be to boost investment or to boost labor supply in the future. And this playbook has been played out time and again in the public finance literature. Once you give that windfall tax, that windfall benefit to already committed capital, almost mathematically it makes it impossible to have a pro-growth uh, tax cut because then you have to compensate for those higher deficits elsewhere either by um, uh, higher tax rates down the road or maybe by, by cutting spending, which is, which is uh, one thing you can do to, to boost growth. But it makes it, once you give a massive windfall tax break to already committed capital, it makes it really hard to boost growth going down the line. And so one observation that Adam and I had was uh, one strategy could be to sort of reverse the massive windfall that we saw, not just for American investors, but also for foreign investors moving forward. Um, and then we suggest some potential policies. One could be uh, to roll back some of the corporate tax cut to somewhere in the range of 25 to 28%. This was a really steep cut, just to remind everyone, 35 to 21 was incredibly steep, it was a huge windfall if you've already owned those assets. Um, to eliminate the pass-through deduction, which doesn't have a lot of economic justification, just costs a lot of money, creates a lot of complexity. Um, I think it sort of accelerates an economic trend towards more pass-throughs that our economy is not quite ready for yet, for a ton of reasons. Um, uh, return to the prior treatment of research. I, I, you know, I, this is one of my least favorite aspects of this plan, which is that it um, uh, sort of penalizes research relative to other types of investment. Uh, and then make permanent pro-investment incentives that were included in the, in the plan but expired uh, too early. A second strategy is to fix the international tax system and limit avoidance and shifting. You know, I think the general approach is sound. Um, it's in line, at least in spirit, with what's been done by other countries, uh, but several reforms are, are warranted. Uh, need to better address profit shifting and have stronger incentives for domestic production without some of the unintended consequences, particularly with respect to tangible investment. Uh, some representative policies that you could achieve this would be a higher minimum tax and uh, applied on a country by country rather than a worldwide basis. Um, eliminate uh, FDII or FIDI and replace with better incentives. The WTA, WTO may do that for us, but that would be one potential strategy. Um, reduce the 10% tangible equity allowance to the rate on 10-year treasuries, or at least drop it down. There's this sort of a 10% threshold um, that may be too high. And I just would refer everyone to our forthcoming paper later on today or tomorrow for more discussion on the international side. Uh, a third strategy is to limit the taxation of capital to, provo to promote more uniform taxation. Um, the taxation of capital has never been particularly uniform in our tax code, and that's even less so now. Um, it retains and exacerbates distortions in the taxation of capital. Um, one example, the exclusion for stepped-up basis in death. So the TCGA did not change the tax treatment of uh, investment income uh, at the shareholder level, but what it did do is likely led to, uh, because of the windfall gains, led to a boost in the equity prices, which exacerbated some of the existing tax expenditures and some of the existing preferences. Um, possible fixes include repeal of step-up basis uh, at death or change to carryover basis. Um, uh, looking at closely held stock and IRAs, we still have $100 million IRAs that hasn't yet been addressed. Uh, and then, and this is not particularly popular in certain sectors, but uh, looking at the unrelated business income uh, by tax exempts, who also got a massive windfall uh, given how much uh, equity they held. Another strategy is to reduce distortionary tax preferences in the individual tax code. 
Uh, despite some high visibility reforms, and I define high vi visibility by whether or not my in-laws mention them to me. Um, so the SALT and the, and the mid limitation um, really did little to, to improve on some of the, the largest tax expenditures. Employer provided health insurance, the exclusion for that was untouched. Retirement saving incentives, untouched. Uh, preferential rates on capital gains, untouched. And a host of smaller provisions were untouched. So there's an, there's an opportunity in the second round with tax reform to address some of that. Um, we could, for example, introduce a Cadillac tax or like reforms to address the exclusion on employer provided health insurance. We could actually make the mid more pro, pro home ownership and sort of putting aside the contentious debate about whether or not we should incent home ownership in the first place. There's a lot of opportunities to reform the mid now, particularly that it's that we have so few itemizers. Uh, to actually have tax-based incentives for home ownership that lead to more people owning homes. Um, and we can make retirement incentives more equitable and effective. Uh, the fourth strategy is to encourage working age Americans to enter the labor force. So this did cut marginal tax rates on labor, uh, like I mentioned earlier, by, by about two percentage points. And that will lead to more people entering the labor force. If you read that CBO uh, uh, summary that I suggested. I mean, I think that's pretty clear, but it wasn't as targeted as it, as it could be, right? So there's some people who are going to be in the labor force no matter what, and they're getting tax cuts. If you actually really wanted to boost labor force participation, you would have a much more targeted set of strategies. I think one of the shames about TCJA is it didn't address the EITC. This is a bipartisan idea. Uh, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of people from various parts of the political spectrum got behind this. This, was, this was, seemed like the perfect opportunity to boost the childless EITC or to make the EITC more generous, and that was missed. Um, we could also have a secondary earner tax credit. Um, this is an idea that we pitched in the Obama administration, was also featured in a Hamilton project. But uh, the idea is just getting the secondary earner uh, into the labor force. Uh, child care subsidy, you could make an economic case why child care should be subsidized in the first place as a cost of doing work. Um, but just given the soaring cost of child care and the, you know, what it contributes to effective marginal tax rates on, on work, I, I'm disappointed that wasn't addressed. But the point is, is that a strategy to actually look at a targeted strategy to get more people in the workforce is a real opportunity in the next, uh, the next tax reform uh, go round. And lastly is, is compliance. Um, I think co compliance is an underappreciated part of, of tax reform. We don't have great estimates based on non-compliance, but um, it's, pretty, it's pretty massive. And so the tax gap, the annual tax gap, plausible estimates are in the range of $500 billion to $650 billion annually. I don't know how that's distributed. My guess is it's probably pretty regressive. Um, the incentives to switch to pass-throughs are uh, may exacerbate the tax gap and the lack of compliance. Um, you know, I think Congress really has two options. Uh, Congress should fund the IRS to administer the tax code that it has. Now, that either means better funding the IRS, or that means making the tax code simpler. But right now, there's a disconnect between the funding and the resources available to the IRS and uh, the ability for taxpayers to comply and willingness to comply with the tax code. I think there's a fundamental disconnect. Um, I'm always surprised by why there's not more sort of public outcry about the tax gap, given that it just is effectively sort of an implicit tax on everyone else, um, and why people who actually pay their taxes are not more angry that others are not. Um, but the point is that there's a real opportunity to improve compliance and makes it, make the tax code simpler. I'll stop there. We have this terrific panel set up. Um, so I can take one or two questions, but I'll be on the second panel, so you can also ask questions there. Um, so maybe I'll take a handful of questions, and then we'll transition to the panel. Steve. Steve Rosenthal, Tax Policy Center. Um, how do you deal with expensing in the way you think about this last tax bill? Ms. Long asked whether or not the increased investments uh, that we're seeing in the first quarter of 2018 is attributable to the TCJA. I think you're saying uh, in part yes, but I think you highlighted lower rates. I would have thought a temporary expensing measure would have shifted a whole bunch of investment from last year into the first quarter. Even those who might have believed in the sort of September effective date would have waited for legislation to be enacted. 
So how does that fit in your model in terms of the effect of the tax bill on general macro effects? So um, I mean, think like Jason, I'm a little wary of reading the, ta the tea leaves on what's going on with investment. I mean, theoretically, if there was investment on the sideline and given the potential for uh, benefits that kicked in in 2018, it would make sense for corporations to hold on, hold off on, on investment. Um, but let me just say, I mean, the, the treatment of investment and the differential treatment of investment by type uh, is, is really inefficient. I mean, this picks winners and losers by R&D, by uh, equipment, by structures. Um, we don't want to pick winners and losers in the tax code, and that's exactly what this does. And so, you know, I think that's a fundamental fundamental problem, which is that it would be better just to have for small businesses just ex expand the expensing, uh, give immediate write-off, and let the economy pick the winners and losers rather than let the tax code do that. Yes. Good morning. Thank you very much. I'm a lawyer, but I identify as someone uh, raised in Wisconsin. In January, Kimberly Clark, a Fortune 500 company, announced that it was uh, eliminating 5,000 5, jobs, including two plants in an area of Wisconsin that flipped for Trump. Um, and Kimberly Clark, CEO, was very straightforward in answering questions that he thanked the Tax Reform Jobs Act for providing Kimberly Clark with the funds it needed to do this corporate restructuring. So my question to you is, to what degree are you and your economics economist colleagues tracking companies like Kimberly Clark that are using the tax reform bill to eliminate rather than create jobs? So that's a great question. So I see real truth in data and I see less truth in statements and anecdotes. Uh, we heard uh, one of the real shames that came out of the public reaction to this was that you heard a lot of anecdotes about companies giving raises. That's not how the labor market works. You don't get a tax cut and then just out of the goodness of your heart, hand $100 or $1,000 to a worker. That's really not how the labor market works. There is a reasonable, uh, perfectly reasonable debate about the extent to which this will raise wages, but it takes time and it's based on more capital coming into the United States, which eventually makes workers more productive. It's not based on altruism. So I don't really track CEO statements all that carefully because they're not binding. Um, uh, we heard at the beginning of the Trump administration from Carrier about how much uh, those policies mattered and you saw that, that Carrier down the line it, it did not act in the way that they said they would. So, um, you know, I think there's truth in data. And uh, look, I'm, I'm not particularly optimistic about this tax cut on the whole. But if the data comes in and shows that investment is boosted far more than we thought and we go back to that first strategy, like, I'm willing to be convinced differently. But the information I have right now, um, uh, I'll wait for the data to make my you know, final judgment on this. But um, I'll look at the data and not statements. Bill. Thanks. Uh, Bill Gale, Tax Policy Center. Uh, you put up uh, uh, five scenarios for the economy and then the logical political outcomes based on those. And uh, I guess. I'm questioning the logic part. I mean, I see a big tax cut at a time when the economy was already at full employment. We have high deficits. We have rising long-term debt. I see a big corporate tax cut at a time when corporate profits are at an all-time high. Uh, I see tax cuts for rich people and corporations at a time when those were the two things that the public opposed most. And the Republicans openly said they did the tax cut because their donors would kill them if they wouldn't. So I'm wondering why you're asserting that the likely political outcomes for extensions or whatever of the tax cut for the treatment of the tax in the future are, are based on the uh, measured economic effects over the next five years. So, uh, <laughs> so 
it's interesting that you interpreted that as the likely political justification. I was just trying to make a point about post-mortem post and not necessarily whether or not that would use, be used for the political justification. Um, the, there's, there's a big disconnect between economic justification, as everyone knows, and political justification. Um, but, I mean, let me say, I mean, you did make the point about, about where we are in the business cycle and this particular tax cut. And I, I do think this, this tax cut was poorly designed for where we are in some long-run trends. There's a lot of immediate stimulus in this tax bill. It's hard to spend $1.5 trillion and not have that. Um, I don't think we're at the point of a business cycle where that makes a ton of sense. We might want to save that for a rainy day. Um, second, we have, we didn't talk about the change in burdens, but one aspect of this bill is that it's, it's a shift between uh, uh, between capital, it's a big shift between capital and labor at a time when we have this decades long decline in the labor share. Um, I really think that we should have paid more attention to that in this bill and given more breaks for uh, uh, labor relative to capital. But so Bill, to answer your question, that's not how I interpreted the, the, the logic, it was more just a post-mortem and how we would explain it. Um, as far as the, the political calculations for if and when we revisit, I really have no idea. I think that depends on a lot. Maybe one more question, then we'll shift to the panel. Yes. Yeah, so your, um, your analysis is sort of saying, well, we didn't quite get it right. Like, we, we should be taxing old capital, you know, and providing incentives for investment. But that, that assumes policy goals. So I think that actually the writers of this bill got it precisely right. They were interested in giving breaks to owners of existing capital and reducing the estate tax, and that's exactly what they did. So it, the bill was not poorly designed. It was designed very well to accomplish what its authors wanted to do. Uh, so I think that's a, that's a fair point. Um, just a few quick reactions. One, you know, I don't want to climb the heads of members of Congress. I've worked there. I've been a staffer on Congress before. Um, and I don't purport to know exactly what they intended to do. But I, your point is well taken. Um, but I think it's a reasonable assumption to say, look, pro-growth should be uh, a, a goal of tax reform. And uh, whether it is or not, whether it is or not, that's a reasonable goal. And so, you know, Adam and I started with this, with this paper with the assumption that, look, we all want a bigger economy. And we can debate whether or not that's, that fits into politicians' uh, uh, goals, but for us, we started with that assumption. Uh, with that, we have a really great panel coming up. We have two of my colleagues from Kellogg uh, flew out from Chicago in addition to uh, uh, other terrific members. So let's just transition the panel. If you have any other questions, I'm happy to answer them up there. Looks like it's on. Okay, great. Uh, I'm Catherine Rampell. I'm an op-ed columnist for the Washington Post. I frequently write about tax policy, so I'm very excited to have this esteemed panel whose brains I can pick today. Um, so you've already heard from Ben Harris. You know who he is. Um, one of the several members of the Kellogg Mafia who's on this panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> and uh, the bios are in front of you, but just to give sort of a, a short summary of who we have. So Ben, besides being at Kellogg, uh, had previously worked uh, for Vice President Joe Biden and in Congress and various other places. Um, Aparna, Aparna Mater, yeah. did I get that? <laughs> did I pronounce it correctly? Okay. Uh, she is a scholar at AEI, uh, frequently writes about tax policy as well as uh, paid family leave and, and various other issues. Mitchell Peterson uh, at Kellogg, who is a finance professor, does a lot of work on empirical corporate finance, 
um, and can talk a little bit about what we're seeing in terms of um, uh, repatriated um, income and, and things like that. Jan Eberly, who is also at Kellogg and had previously worked, among other places, in the Treasury Department under President Obama as the uh, Assistant Secretary of Economic Policy. Is that right? And then at the very end, Ben Page, uh, who is a scholar or fellow, I think is the title. Senior fellow. fellow. Senior fellow. Yeah. Got to get it right. Uh, at the Tax Policy Center. And uh, among his responsibilities is trying to model the macroeconomic effects of various tax policies. Uh, so with that, um, we've heard from Ben Harris, one of the two Bens, uh, about what the law maybe got right and got wrong. And Aparna, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit from your perspective about what an ideal tax policy would look like uh, if growth is your objective, which I, I think uh, many members of Congress would say it is, uh, what it would look like uh, both on the corporate and individual sides and how those objectives or how those principles measure up to what actually passed. Great. Thank you so much for having me uh, here at TPC. And Catherine, thank you for moderating this panel. Um, that's a great question. I think, you know, all throughout the fall, all of us were sort of speculating on what the tax bill would look like and what it should look like. And, you know, we had a ton of ideas. Some of them made it in there. Some of them didn't. Um, I, I do agree with a lot of what Jason said. You know, I think there's broad agreement amongst economists on what the tax bill missed and what it got right. When you look at the corporate side, uh, you know, e for several years now, for decades, people have been writing about how tax, corporate taxes in the US uh, are sort of, uh, we have an outdated system. We haven't seen corporate tax reform since the 1980s. Uh, we, we're uh, living in a global economy where capital is mobile, where if you, you know, don't keep up with the tax competition, you're likely to lose investments. We have a ton of academic research that supports that idea that if you're not competitive in corporate taxes, you're not going to you know, have physical capital investments taking place in the US. Uh, and so building off of that, you know, the fact that we had one of the highest corporate tax <coughs> rates in the OECD, uh, there was this push to get business side reform done. Uh, at the same time, we do have academic research saying that, yes, you know, if you do get those investments, uh, those will translate at some point to higher wages for workers through higher, uh, you know, productivity, through higher capital investments in workers. And I don't think there's disagreement there either. Uh, I, thi I think where we did, you know, where there is a potential for uncertainty is in the size of that effect. And you know, I don't think anybody has a crystal ball on whether that number looks like four thousand dollars or you know whether it's a thousand dollars. I have no personal stake in that. I've done some of that research. I understand, you know, we're doing, we're looking at uh, all of that research has sort of focused on countries around the globe that have very different tax systems that uh, have very different, uh, you know, sort of economic underpinnings. Um, so, so we, there is uncertainty. I think it's, a, it's an experiment in the U.S. To, to try to say, okay, if we had this massive reduction in corporate taxes, what would it do for, for the average worker? I think it's an experiment that, that we are going to try out now, precisely because we haven't ever had you know, a tax change in, that can effectively be incorporated into empirical studies. Uh, so, so I love the business side reforms. I think they make the, the case for the U.S. to be a more competitive economy. I think they, they will at some point you know, translate into higher capital flows into the US and to higher productivity and investment. I do worry about the deficit. You know, I do think that all of us were hoping that there would be much more base broadening, that there would be other provisions that would be adopted that would offset the, you know, the revenue losses that are likely to come at least uh, you know, in, in the short run and potentially also in the long run from having such a massive corporate tax cut. Uh, and so one of the ideas that I was talking about was a carbon tax. I see that in uh, you know, Jason's slide and in, uh, uh, ben, in Ben's presentation too. Uh, yeah, we, sh you know, we could do a carbon tax and if you're looking at sort of making up a trillion dollars in revenues over a decade, a carbon tax is pr precisely would do exactly, you know, would do exactly that and also help me help us meet other goals so I think you know doing the business side reforms made sense we should have done more to make up the loss in revenues through a carbon tax I also agree we could be doing a lot more to directly help lower income families such as through an expanded EITC 
Uh, it, it was surprising to all of us that that was something that never made it into the bill, even though there seemed to be so much bipartisan support for it. Uh, and I also worry about the fact that the individual tax provisions are, are going to expire at some point, and, and you know, all the positive uh, impacts that we're likely to see through those are, are going to go away. So, so I do hope that in round two of the tax bill, some of these considerations are taken into account. Um, uh, but 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 I do think that you know the business side reforms made sense, and we and we now we need to figure out well how do we actually get the revenues to to make it happen and not have the sort of the you know the negative growth impacts and the negative potential investment impacts that come from that. Uh, ben Page, you had worked on the modeling for the the TCJA. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about why there is this. So somewhat dispersion in the estimates amongst the models that came out from TPC, from Penn Wharton, from the administration, from CBO, what accounts for the fact that, I mean, the numbers to some extent are all over the place. I mean, some of them are clustered together, but there are some outliers there as well. So um, I think that maybe surprisingly, and there, there are varying degrees of transparency in the estimates, but I've looked at them and, and a lot of the differences really come down to one thing, and that's the impact of the TCJA on foreign capital flows. So the big differences between the estimates come in the degree to which they think that the capital stock will increase as a result of the bill. Um, most of them don't uh, seem to incorporate a big response of private saving, and that's consistent with empirical estimates. We don't see uh, a private saving respond a whole lot, be very sensitive to after-tax returns. So I, I think that's kind of a consensus. You don't see a big range in the labor supply response between the estimates, um, partly because there, there aren't huge changes in uh, taxes on wages and salaries. Um, marginal tax rates on, on labor income. Um, and most of the analysts seem to, to have a fairly low elast labor supply elasticity that supplied to those small changes, which once again is consistent with empirical evidence. There's, there's a huge volume of, of empirical uh, evidence on, on labor supply el elasticities. So kind of the, the factor that's left is, is um, the reason that these different estimates have very different impacts on the capital stock is they forecast very different amounts of, of foreign capital inflows due to the tax bill. And on the one extreme, there's kind of a, an assumption that the U.S. is a small open economy and that uh, basically all that th the, the investment that cor companies demand is going to be supplied by foreigners on the margin once, once you take away whatever uh, changes in private saving and, uh, and public saving uh, uh, happen. And uh, on the other side, and that, that's the reason that you get big estimates uh, on, for the long run effect from places like the Tax Foundation, the Barrow Furman uh, uh, estimates also in the long run were pretty similar, and it's, it's really just math. If you, if you assume that all that investment demand is going to be supplied, um, the, there's not a big range of, of results that you're going to get. Uh, uh, PWBMs, uh, the Penn Wharton models, uh, open economy estimates are also similar. Uh, open economy estimates that I've done are similar. So if, if you believe that foreign capital is going to flow in to supply whatever uh, uh, firms want to invest, you get those big effects. Um, uh, on the other side, uh, uh, you know, some, some of us didn't believe that, there, that capital was really that mobile, that there really are going to be those big responses. That's the reason that uh, TPC is towards the, the bottom in the estimates. We forecast a much smaller effect on, on foreign capital flows. Um, which you know we're one one end of the scale uh, a bit on that um, in that aspect. One thing that makes me feel better is the the other organization that was at the bottom of the scale was the International Monetary Fund. So they know something about uh, foreign capital flows. Uh, so so that's a little bit reassuring to me. But the fact of the matter is, people are pretty much. Uh, it's not something that there's great evidence on. So there there's a range of opinions. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure, you know, as a profession, we have a great handle on what the right answer really is.
how sensitive are those numbers to what other countries do? Like I was in China around the time when the tax cuts were passing in the United States, and there was a lot of concern about whether that was going to actually draw capital out of China, um, in, or in, out, uh, capital that could have gone to China, and send it to the United States because uh, tax rates would be lower here. And subsequently, China announced a tax cut. So, so how sensitive are these numbers and these estimates to what other countries might end up doing? So, so they would be pretty sensitive under the extreme assumptions. You'd have to have all the other countries changing. So. Um, uh, or, or at least, you know, uh, uh, enough that that it represented a significant fraction of the of the available capital in the world. But yeah, to the to the extreme, if if other countries changed the, their kind of taxation of capital to the <coughs> same extent as the U.S., there wouldn't be any reason for there to be capital inflows. You wouldn't you you would get very small uh, economic effects. Uh, Jan, one of the objectives of this session today is to talk about missed opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering to what extent we should be thinking about timing uh, when we're thinking about the most opportune ways to design a tax cut or to pass a tax cut. We are in um, one of the longest recoveries on record. We already have uh, very high debt to GDP. Could you talk a little bit about um, how these how, how the cyclical and structural um, trends that we're in right now affect how we should be thinking about this tax cut and how effective it will be in boosting growth? Okay. Um, that's a good question to follow up on, on Ben's comments about what's happening outside the, the bill itself, because the economic environment uh, is one where economists are talking about you know, really how how low will uh, unemployment go? How close are we, or perhaps even beyond full employment? Uh, and so, of course, the the question arises whether this is the the time to use fiscal capacity, um, and in particular, a lot of fiscal capacity, one and a half trillion to two trillion, depending on on which estimates you're using. Uh, so, uh, Bill Gale alluded to this a little bit earlier. I try to move us forward here. Uh, and I think it's worth looking at the, the data on this. So the chart that you see here shows the deficit to GDP ratio on the left scale using CBO numbers. Uh, and then the right scale takes a little more explanation because it's an inverted scale, but it shows the unemployment rate. Uh, and it's inverted, so think of it as the strength of the labor market uh, <coughs> is on the right-hand scale. And um, an, an advantage of going back to academia is that we can look back at decades of data uh, and try to put current uh, performance and, and current decisions in a longer run perspective. Uh, and so those that you see in this chart is there's a remarkable coherence historically uh, between movements in the deficit and movements in the strength of the economy, uh, which is a way of saying that uh, deficits are typically cyclically. Uh, driven and while the the levels can get out of whack which gives you uh, deficits that persist over a longer period of time the dynamics the movements uh, have a strong cyclical component historically and so while we've talked about uh, some of the characteristics of the bill and, and its internal content uh, thinking about its implications for deficits focuses on another remarkable aspect of it, which is how far it takes us um, out of the historical perspective or out of the historical record um, on the cyclical component of, of the deficit. So you see this real break at the end where the unemployment rate uh, in red is going down to around 4%, uh, which is quite low by any historical standard, and we start to see the deficit widen out. Uh, so that decoupling uh, of the deficit forecast going forward from the cyclical measures of the economy um, is really quite um, unprecedented. And so for economics, it leads you to the question of whether this was really the time that we wanted to use that fiscal capacity. And when we revisit the tax bill, as we will have to uh, going forward, all the speakers have emphasized that having used the fiscal capacity now 
makes that second visit more difficult uh, in the sense that the, li the lift is higher and the lift is harder. So it's higher because we've already run up the deficit in advance and it's harder um, because it's unlikely that the economy in the future will be even stronger uh, than it is now on a cyclical basis. That is, we may have to be facing these deficits and the adjustment um, of revenue to spending at a time when profitability is not as strong as it is now uh, and the economy is not as strong as it is now. So it, it makes all of those decisions and economic impacts in the future even more difficult. Um, the, let me skip this and thinking about the external uh, implications. So the other major component of macro policy, of course, is monetary policy, uh, which gets less emphasis in this room. But if we want to talk about uh, interest rates, that is a, a place to go. And so the, the Fed dot plots uh, give us uh, some expectation about future interest rates uh, from people who know, uh, so people who sit on the FOMC. Uh, and what the dot plots show us and, and what this chart shows is changes in expectations um, at different horizons from last fall to now. Uh, so last fall is the, the, cir the open circles uh, and then this spring's uh, most recent dot plots are in the um, the solid green circles. And there's a, there's a very modest change uh, from last fall to now. So I think this is consistent with uh, other warnings not to try to read the tea leaves too much because the, the movements are very small. Um, but there is sort of an upward movement uh, in the lowest dots. That is, people who were expecting the lowest interest rates have revised up a little bit. Uh, and maybe a little bit move, more movement on the top as you go out. Um, but we've seen strengthening economic growth. There's more expectations of Fed tightening. Uh, so there is broad upward pressure on interest rates, and, and that's reflected uh, here. Little movement on the far right. Uh, which is the long run forecast. And this is also consistent with Jason's argument on the economic side that even if we're seeing uh, stronger growth in the short run, longer run forecasts haven't really changed very much. And the, and the interest rate forecasts reflect that uh, change. So the, but regardless of what is moving the dots, the fact that they are higher, that uh, interest rates are moving higher, makes all it makes the lift on the fiscal side more difficult that is it makes the stimulus weaker because the interest rates because the the monetary side is tightening um, and then it makes the fiscal side more expensive uh, because the deficits have to be financed so everything that the these movements we're seeing on the outside uh, I think make the internal uh, workings of the bill and it's revisiting it in the future uh, more difficult so as daunting as some of the changes that uh, Ben and Jason talked about earlier seem already. Uh, when you look at, at the external forces, uh, I, it's not the most cheerful message I'm, I'm going to give. So, so Mitchell, speaking of timing, I'm wondering if you could comment a little bit about the timing of the corporate tax cuts, given that, as has been noted, um, cor corporate profits are at a record high, uh, equity financing is quite cheap right now, interest rates are low, companies are sitting on a lot of cash, all of which suggests, as I think Jason had mentioned before, that if companies aren't investing, it's because they're not seeing opportunities out there rather than um, the fact that they don't have the money or they don't have the, they don't have the financing, essentially. Um, me, yeah, so, so I'm wondering yeah. if you could comment on, on all of that. Let that, me get there timing. with a slight detour. So as Catherine said, I come to this from finance. And so the way to sort of understand the motivation behind some of the international provisions and therefore help us understand, as Catherine says, what the implications are, is I came into this picture uh, that it comes from the Federal Reserve that looks at the increased cash on the balance sheets. And so from 98 to 2014, it increased from about $800 billion to about 3.2 trillion. Now, to her question, there's a couple of reasons why firms hold cash. Number one reason is it's precautionary savings. I want to make sure I have money so that if a project shows up and I go to the capital market and they say no, I can fund it. 
this picture is very hard to explain with that because what you see is if it increases 3x, that means the world's become more risky or capital markets have become less liquid in the last two decades. And more interestingly, pre-2008, post-2008, it's exactly the same. So apparently 2008 was not on the radar of anybody's risk. The problem, second issue is in terms of taxes, and that's where the money was potentially trapped abroad. This picture can't tell you the answer to that because we don't know where the money is abroad. Fortunately, our friends at the Bureau of Economic Analysis got about 11 years of data, and if you look at the increase in domestic cash, multinationals or domestic firms, it goes up about 80% over that 11-year period. If you look at the amount of foreign cash, it goes up by about 5x. So if I want to explain the increase, I need to have a story about these foreign subsidiaries. And there's basically three things that go on. As we've talked about, if you think about in 98 where when it starts and you ask where the money is abroad, it's in foreign countries, but it tends to be in big economies, in the United Kingdom, in France, in Germany. If you look at the fraction of cash and the fraction of sales held in those countries, they're very similar. By the time you get to 2008, a lot of the cash tends to be held in relatively small economies. Belgium, Luxembourg, Switzerland, Ireland, the UK. Why? Reason number one, foreign tax rates came down, the US didn't, so I wanted to move money abroad. Reason number two, the desire to do it isn't sufficient, you have to have a mechanism. And so in 97 and 98, we passed a set of rules called check the box. One of the unintended consequences, it made easier to set up foreign subsidiaries and move income across these countries. Third thing is the way we produce used to be physical capital. You take rubber, glass, and steel, and you make a car in Detroit, and I know you made it in Detroit. As you move to intangible assets, the physical location becomes more difficult. So what happens? If you look at firms that do R&D versus not, you look at firms that sell to themselves, one sub to the other, and say, of that increase in cash, where did it all occur? 92% of the increase, the blocks, is in the firms that have IP, i.e. do R&D, and have related sales. Now, what does that mean? It means that the, quote, cash got trapped abroad, but what's the implication? And I want to quickly talk about two sort of possibilities. Catherine's question is, now that there's no toll and the money can come home, and you see it coming home, or it isn't relevant, what's the effect? Let's look at a macro and then a micro effect. The discussion is all this money is trapped abroad. And I want you to draw a picture in your mind of what you think trap means. And when you hear the politicians talk about this, there's this huge warehouse outside the airport in Dublin with $20 bills stacked to the ceiling. And once this law passes, we're going to put those on planes and we're going to fly them to New York and we're going to be able to invest. That's not the world you and I live in. It is deposited in a branch of a Dublin bank or it is deposited in a branch of a Manhattan bank. So that money is in the global capital market, and it's going to flow to the highest return. Very hard to tell a macro story. How about a micro story? The micro story is kind of what Jason suggested. I've got a great project in the US, but I don't have cash in the US. I went to the capital markets, and they said no. If I bring the money back from abroad, it costs me 25%, so I choose not to. Once you eliminate that friction, then you're going to have the effect. And here's where Jan's comment about the timing occurs. If you think the constraint on investment is they don't have cash, it has a huge effect. If you think the constraint on investment is they don't have ideas, it has very no, little effect. The closest we have to an experiment is the American Jobs Creation Act of 2004. If you look at the money that was brought back, 75% of the firms that brought back had access to the bond market or were cash flow positive in the US, and on the margin, they invested zero dollars over the next three years. 25% of firms that were cash flow negative in the US and did not have access to the bond market invested 80%. You pass the law in 04, you pass the law in 2017, it's hard to tell a story. You pass the law in 2008, you might have had a big effect. Hmm. Uh, ben Harris. You talked a little bit, you, or your presentation was, was primarily focused on things that we should be doing um, to improve the legislation. And by the way, as some of you may have seen, uh, President Trump again said last night, there is going to be another tax bill this year, although I wouldn't hold my breath for that. Um, but in any case, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about whether there are provisions in the bill beyond um, just the deficit effect that weigh on growth. Are there, are there things that actually will slow growth in this bill? Uh, so let me... Let me sort of answer your question by saying 
I, I think that big tax reform should solve big problems, right? If you're going to spend $2 trillion, you should get something for it. And I'm we're sort of hard pressed to have anyone make the case that this tax reform bill solved any really big problems. Our corporate rate was probably too high. There were certain distortions in the tax code, but not it's not worth $2 trillion. And so, you know, I think that one of the missed opportunities was addressing some of the really big problems in the economy. And if you're going to ask me if I want to prioritize some of the largest problems, one of the biggest problems has been decades of stagnant wages. And, you know, maybe on the margin this addressed that. <coughs> Um, this addressed it through, uh, you know, there's going to be some more capital in the economy and hopefully we get some more factories and some more investment. Maybe you get some extra software and that filters through to, to wages or maybe that's bigger than I'm anticipating. But this, this is $2 trillion and we didn't solve any big problems. And as Jan just noted, not only do we not solve any big problems, we just, we just forfeited an opportunity to solve some really big problems in the future because we've spent all the money. So, you know, I think that's one of, the, one, of the, one of the biggest problems, which is we've just, we've accelerated our, our deficit concerns by a few years, and we've given up the opportunity uh, to do some really good things in the future. Um, one thing that I, uh, I don't think you mentioned, but I'm curious about is if we're talking about raising uh, workers' pay, we're, we're thinking about how do we help low-wage workers, what about payroll taxes? Did, I don't think that came up in the presentation. So, um, I, I've, I've been a proponent of just cutting the payroll tax, and I don't think there are a lot of people that share my view. Some people say don't cut the payroll tax because it undermines Social Security, but we had uh, several years of a two percentage point cut in the payroll tax without a single implication for Social Security. This is an accounting mechanism. We can solve this. It's taking money from one bucket and putting it in another. If you want to give workers a tax cut, just give workers a tax cut. You know, if you want to boost after-tax wages, just boost after-tax wages. And the most direct way to do that is by cutting the payroll tax cut, uh, but by, by cutting the payroll tax. And I, I get the argument for, uh, for cutting the corporate tax rate, but I just don't think it's direct enough. And I actually think that the accounting mechanism by which we have payroll taxes in people's mind paying for Social Security and income taxes paying for everything else has been to the detriment of workers. I mean, TPC has been terrific at putting out estimates showing uh, the sort of maybe surprising number of people who pay more in payroll taxes than they do in income taxes. But we get income tax cut after income tax cut, after corporate tax cut, after estate tax cut, and we've only had this tiny payroll tax cut over the past several decades. So, you know, I think it would be good for workers if we just had one income tax, we incorporated the payroll tax and the income tax, maybe had the burden the same, but next time we spend $2 trillion, maybe some of it will go directly to workers instead of all to, to everyone else. Ben Page, uh, two of our presentations earlier today talked a little bit about the distributional consequences of the tax cut, um, but shied away from what the growth consequences of that distributional impact would be. I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about how you think in your modeling about increased inequality and how that affects growth. Is that something that TPC has done research on or is thinking about? So there, there's um, there's a number of ways where, uh, by which increased inequality could, uh, could affect growth. Um, kind of the classical uh, viewpoint is, oh, if there's more inequality, uh, there's kind of more incentive to do better. Um, if you look across countries, the research hasn't been very kind to that, that assumption, and uh, a, a lot of times you see strong growth in countries that have a strong middle class and, and actually are more um, egalitarian. So, you know, uh, uh, I think a lot of times people talk about the growth implications in the, in the short run that uh, if, you're, if you're trying to do a, a short run stimulus, uh, it's much more helpful to have that targeted towards the low <coughs> end of the income scale than the than a high end. Uh, this tax bill certainly had a, has a stimulus effect. I don't think that was the goal of it. So, so the fact that it was targeted towards the top end and, and that, that probably makes that stimulus less than it otherwise would be, uh, that's probably not a, a foremost concern in, in, in most people's minds. One thing that I would say that's, that's maybe was implied but, but missed a little bit. So, uh, um, uh, Jason in his talk, and I think Ben alluded to it also, 
um, talked about the, the difference between the impact on GDP and GNP and, and national incomes. And I kind of didn't, I didn't finish my thought when I talked about the, the difference between macro estimates largely coming from capital inflows. Kind of a, a, an implication of that is that they, they're not really as far apart as you'd think. If you go toward to national income, the, those various estimates would be a lot closer um, and a lot smaller to the extent that, that a lot of financing comes from, uh, um, uh, from foreigners. But that <coughs> is talking about kind of the overall pie and not the distribution. And if there's a bunch of money coming in from foreigners and increasing the capital stock, uh, uh, the, 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 those foreign investors are gonna need to hire people, you expect wages to go up, and uh, uh, domestic firms have to pay those same higher wages, so their profits should go down. So kind of <coughs> in terms of the, the, the direct distributional effects of, of the bill are, are quite bad from the point of view of, of not being progressive, from the point of view of being regressive. But if, if you did have this kind of big uh, uh, foreign inflows, I do want to say that there is this positive effect. Even if national income is not going up a whole lot, you can kind of get a, a distributional shift towards workers and away from owners of capital. Um, so you're talking mostly about the supply side as opposed to <coughs> demand side consequences of and and yes and I think just be, l largely because of well kind of you know what Jan was talking about at this point in the the business cycle it's just you know your your demand side effects aren't really what you want <laughs> like you're you're not looking to to provide a lot of stimulus to an economy when the unemployment rate's already below four percent uh, and to the extent that you do provide stimulus, you'd expect the, the Federal Reserve to do <coughs> everything it could to, to offset that stimulus, which, which is going to limit it, you know, in, in certainly in the medium run, uh, the, amount, the amount that it's actually going to do. So I, I think, yes, in, in the current uh, context, I think much more of the, the kind of sub long run supply effects rather than the short run demand effects. Uh, Aparna, you mentioned, I think, before, and uh, this <coughs> seems to be sort of the conventional wisdom amongst economists, that what we want out of any sort of corporate tax reform is to broaden the base and lower rates, right? I mean, this is sort of the mantra. Jim Hines at the University of Michigan had given this paper, uh, I think, at the Brookings Papers on Econo uh, Brookings BPEA, Brookings Papers on Economic, Ac yeah. economic Activity. Thank you. Uh, I think it was last year uh, where he essentially argued that an efficient design of a corporate income tax system would encourage activities with beneficial spillovers and uh, have a lighter tax burden on those that are more responsive to taxation, uh, <coughs> which he has in some cases summarized as uh, narrow the base, raise rates that we should have more targeted tax breaks, tax breaks basically in areas that we think are likely to produce more growth. Could you talk a little bit about that perspective? Um, does it seem reasonable? It, you know, it, it seems to be an outlier, again, from what I've heard from other economists, and why is that? Yeah, I mean, you know, it, 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 it does seem like an outlier opinion to say we should raise rates and sort of narrow the base. Uh, all we, you know, in, in the, at least the, the corporate side that we, um, the mantra has always <coughs> been, we are sort of losing out by having really high rates. And yes, we, you know, we, what we could be b better off if we actually cut rates and try to broaden the base. Because what, you know, there, there is research, as I mentioned, that says that even a high headline rate, and you could argue that effective rates are actually lower than, you know, the headline rate of 39.6% that we used to have. But yes, effective rates uh, were still relatively high compared to the rest of the OECD. A and so maybe if we, if we cut rates, but we broaden the base, we, we have some of that in the current tax bill. They do limit interest deductibility. I think on the individual side, there is some attempt to broaden the base as you know, Ben mentioned with the SALT deduction and the, and the mortgage interest deduction. Again, nobody had imagined that those would be things that could ever actually pass in a tax bill. So I think you have to give credit <coughs> and that, that they did go after you know, that kind of ba uh, base broadening. We, we did see some of that, but obviously you know, what you have at the end of the day is still a bill that's adding hugely to the deficit. A and as Jason mentioned, it's very tough within the existing tax framework, I think, to even design a bill that would be revenue neutral because there is just a limit to how much you can broaden the base. 
Um, so, uh, so I do think sort of having higher taxes outside the tax base, like having a carbon tax, uh, could be a potential way to fix that problem that, that we're seeing within the current system that yes, you know, we all agree cutting rates might be beneficial. We all agree broadening the base is beneficial. But even then, you know, we're, we're stuck with this problem where we have trillion dollar deficits over, over a, a long horizon. Um, so, so I do think sort of raising rates um, where such, uh, such as through a carbon tax where, where you know, we, we understand that there are externalities that's something that, again, both sides could potentially agree upon. Um, and then using some of the carbon tax revenues, not just to, to cover the deficit loophole, but at the same time to maybe expand something like the EITC that would be directly beneficial to low-income families, I think, uh, you know, is, is something that should have been part of the broader package. Uh, so, so um, yeah, I do think that, you know, they tried to do some of the base broadening. We did see rate cuts, but you're right, we, we sort of need to step outside the current system and look at other potential areas where tax rates could be raised, which, you know, which are sort of addressing other externalities that we're not even talking about. Mm -hmm. Catherine, can, can I follow up yes, on that? Yes, please. I have a, maybe a little discussion in the panelists. The, um, on the tax targeting point, um, just a, a different angle on that is when we talk about the um, uh, the focus on investment and growth in the capital stock and that that feeds through to wages and, and growth and, and the, the positive effects of the tax bill. We're sort of implicitly assuming um, that capital investment uh, will drive productivity and that um, because we're not thinking that capital investment is, is is good just for its own sake, though it contributes to GDP directly. Um, but what we're thinking is that there's a mechanism that connects it to productivity growth. And you know, when you when you look at the data, I mean, the investment's been weak since the early 2000s, um, and across all types of capital. So there's a big gap that's that's built up because Tobin's Q has been strong, profitability has been strong. So investment has been sort of puzzlingly weak for a long time, uh, and so it seems natural to try to you know tilt the tax code to try to. Um, compensate or try to improve performance there. Um, but So that's the time series. But when you look at the, the cross-section of investment, the, the, the strongest parts of the growth in the capital stock have been structures like the oil and gas uh, investment, a little bit in telecom, which is mostly uh, towers. Uh, and then investment's been very weak in manufacturing and traditionally equipment intensive uh, industries. And then, but in the industries that have really had strong growth, uh, where we have seen some productivity growth, uh, like high tech and bio, um, their investment has really been flat, which is, which is quite surprising given what we, you know, we normally think growth would, would drive investment. We're not seeing that at all. Where you do see investment in those sectors is in intangibles. Uh, so you see intellectual property, you see R&D, you see copyrights, trademarks, right? So, so you see this other type of investment. And so I was really struck, if we're thinking about tax targeting, by the results in the Barrow-Furman paper, that the one area where user cost goes up uh, under the, the TCGA is for R&D. Uh, and so as we go forward and think about fixes, are they having a more nuanced approach to capital and, and not just that you know promoting equipment investment is good for the economy, but thinking about what promotes productivity growth um, might lead us to a, a more careful treatment um, of intangibles. And I, usually when we hear about intangibles in this discussion, it's the international uh, and tax avoidance and, and all of those concerns. Um, but domestically, uh, thinking about you know, the incentives for productivity growth and not just capital, not just accumulating blocks of machinery, uh, m might lead to a little more nuance in, in how we do this. And just to, to add to that, you know, one of the discouraging things and uh, uh, one of the slides that was up was the big negative effect on, on R&D, that um, that was kind of the uh, something, a, a sector that got hit by the tax bill uh, rather than, than uh, uh, 
improving the returns. And you know, if anything, if you're, you're thinking about productivity, that might be on the top of your list of what you would want to encourage. I mean, on that, it doesn't the FIDI sort of give you that incentive a little bit? Like, no idea. I mean, there you are tell me. Yeah. <laughs> there are sort of other international tax provisions that try to provide that, uh, you know, incentive in the U.S. for locating intangible capital through FDII. Uh, ben Harris, over the last several years, particularly, uh, I would say, in the second term of the Obama administration, we heard a lot about rising uncertainty and what role that might be having on the economy, on companies' willingness to invest and make various decisions and hire and so on. Um, I'm wondering what you think of uh, the fact that there are a, a number of provisions whose future is, remains uncertain going forward uh, in this tax bill and how that is likely to affect business behavior and consequently growth. Uh, so certainty is a good thing. I um, <coughs> feel pretty comfortable saying that. There was, I remember uh, my first stint in the Obama administration, I was in a room with a bunch of, uh, I'll say, business leaders, and they were sort of lamenting to another senior member of the administration about how uh, the lack of certainty in the tax code is making it really harder for them to do business. And the response by this other person was, well, what if we just all agreed on a higher tax rate? Would you be happy? And <laughs> it was like <laughs> silence, right? So. Um, certainty is good, um, but other things are, 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 are good as well. Um, uh, so, you know, I do think that some of the near-term provisions that expire are problematic, particularly when it comes to investment. And companies have been subject to a constantly shifting schedule for uh, depreciation. Uh, you know, it seems like every other year going back to 2000, and that's got to be tough. I mean, it's never been my, my job to decide when to make a uh, decision about investment or not, but I've got to imagine that all these shifts and all these anticipated shifts and putting different probabilities on whether or not Congress will enact something in the next year makes the job of corporate managers really hard. So um, I not think to mention the fact that the IRS hasn't written a lot of the regulations that exactly. flow from. And this so law. you know, I think it's a problem. I think it would be nice to have a permanent tax code and one that doesn't expire. A lot of that's built on budget conventions. Um, and I get that, but I, you know, I think that, particularly with respect to investment, it, my speculation has been it's just got to really make the, the jobs of corporate managers really difficult. Uh, yeah, Mitchell, I was, yeah, I was going to ask you for your thoughts. The other thing that we haven't talked about is the role of the tax code in creating or dampening financial fragility. So it, the current tax code says we would like you as a corporation to not use equity to use debt because we will pay 35 and now 21% of it. And I assume the social objective is there's nothing more valuable in the economy than a highly levered, fragile corporate sector. <laughs> okay, good, because sometimes people don't pick up my sarcasm. So dropping the corporate tax rate reduces the incentive to have leverage, so that's going to create deleveraging. The cap on interest deductibility, especially the real high ones, will reduce the leverage. So those both tend to promote fr financial sort of resilience. What happens with the next recession, though, is some of these things are going to flip the other way. So you were a relatively low-levered firm, and that 30% limit wasn't binding, and now it is. And it used to be that your taxes would disappear as your income did, not so much. The other provision that we haven't talked about is we've also eliminated carrybacks. Right. And carrybacks were always a way for the tax code to take on some of the risk. And so it's not just the levered firms, but even some of the low levered, when times are bad, all of a sudden they're not going to get those refunds. And there's no discussion now because the economy is good. Two, three, four, assuming we don't reverse things, out. It, as an academic, it will be fascinating as a member of society less so. <laughs> well, what, what has been the track record so far in the data? Um, there is no data yet. So there's lots of discussions. And part of the problem is they don't always implement it until the law changes. So some of the people that I've talked to said a lot of these highly levered transactions are going to disappear. Others say we think there's no effect. I don't believe those guys. Um, certainly, they're going to think much harder about it. And the problem is you set your debt today, but you don't know what your income is going to be till tomorrow. So if that's something you're worried about, then you're not going to be at 28%. You're going to be well below that. So I think it, over time, it's going to tend to move people down. But kind of like we saw a slow response in investment, I don't expect to see an immediate response. 
because they're not sure. And then the second thing, it's one thing not to issue debt, it's another to repay debt. And so where you're gonna start to see is the firms with the shortest amount of debt in terms of maturity, they in general tend to be the most resilient because they can afford that volatility. It's when that longer term debt comes due to see whether it's actually rolled over. And can we just add one thing, which is on, on the on the in individual side, uh, when households have two long term planning problems, one is home ownership and another is retirement. Uh, this has injected more uncertainty into both those. So on home ownership, you have no idea whether or not you can continue to deduct. Uh, the uh, the property taxes beyond 2025. I mean, there is some probability this will be continued. There'll be some probability this will be so unpopular to get rolled back, and there's be some pr a probability that it will go back to uh, prior law. It makes the home ownership buying decision for some taxpayers really difficult. The second thing is when it comes to retirement saving. Retirement saving, we we spend tens of billions of dollars subsidizing retirement saving in this country. Most of it is based on the concept of deferral, which is you can take a deduction today and then repay at lower rates when you retire. If you have constantly moving ta income tax rates, that makes that calculation really difficult. So not only has it complicated the decision for companies, but for American households, their two biggest long-term planning decisions, whether or not to buy a house and how to save for retirement, has also gotten a lot harder. Uh, I, I also wonder if individuals, if you're thinking about um, the future of the retirement system are concerned if they're if it's even on their radar screen about the future of Social Security uh, as a result of the fact that we've taken on you know 1.5 trillion two trillion dollars worth of additional debt yeah I mean look this whole plan and all the distributional effects look really different if it's followed up later with big cuts to Medicare and Social Security Right, like if this, if this was a plan designed to lower revenue that would basically force Congress's hand in reforming, those, reforming or cutting those two, those two programs, all the distributional tables that TPC has spent so much time doing go out the window and things look really different. You know, if you want to sell someone a bill of go goods, sell it to them in one step, not two. And, um, uh, you know, it will, it will change how we talk about growth going forward, um, but it has massive implications for the well-being, obviously, of, of older Americans. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jan, could you talk a little bit more about what response we've seen in financial markets thus far um, to various concerns about crowd out effects and, and growth? Or I, think it's, I mean, obviously, financial markets respond a lot more quickly um, than the real economy. Um, but the, the difficulty is you don't get the Ceteris Paribus experiment. You don't get to hold other things equal. Uh, and... You know, no surprise to anybody who's been watching markets, there's been a lot of volatility uh, since the beginning of the year, probably driven by things that are not just the, the changes in the tax code, um, because trade has uh, played a, a, a big role in that, discussions about, you know, many met a, a wide variety of policy changes. So uh, I think I wouldn't want to uh, extrapolate from that. What, what you can see, uh, I guess, um, is changes in, it, it's easier to look at fixed income markets, so uh, you can see what's happening uh, <coughs> to rates, and, and both uh, Jason and, and Ben talked a bit about that. Um, there is a, a bit of an uptick in inflation, uh, which from the Fed's point of view is encouraging, um, because since 2014 there was a downturn in um, inflation. And inflation expectations have been pretty steady, but sort of the, uh, the break-even inflation rate that you would get out of tips markets um, had declined, and so you know, that led to more concern about you know, we, uh, a weaker economy. That's picked up, um, and that break-even inflation rate uh, last year, or prior prior to the um, upturn, was below two percent. It was around 1.85, uh, and now it's over two. Uh, so there's been a little move upward movement on inflation. You know, obviously, it's, it, tax cuts aren't the only uh, uh, thing that's been changing. The upturn in global economic growth plays an important role because these are global markets, right? This is not, even though it's U.S. Treasuries, it's not just a U.S. market. Uh, so that's putting upward pressure on those as well. So, you know, all of what's driving them, I think, is a much harder question than what their impact will be on the fiscal side. Uh, and higher rates, uh, as we said before, make the lift higher um, on um, 
on the, on the fiscal side because it makes the debt more expensive. And just to echo what Jan said about how difficult it is to interpret what's happening in financial markets, they're forward looking. So they probably started to price in as soon as Trump was elected, started to price in increased deficits and reduce taxes on capital. I mean, those were the the proposals all along. And with a Republican Congress, it was highly likely that something with those two features was going to pass. And then it just gets more and more likely as you get closer. So it's not like you can look at when the bill passed and say, oh, what happened to markets then? Uh, because the, to a great extent, they were expecting it. I, I guess the question is, why haven't why hasn't the tenure gone up <coughs> even more? Given that we we've increased our our debt, um, our you know our future deficits, uh, you mentioned what's going on in the rest of the world. Europe has announced that it's ending QE, which should be raising rates um, there, and so therefore making uh, investors demand higher rates here. You have Fed roll off this year, uh, which means that you're dumping even more supply of Treasuries onto the market. So you have greater supply and potentially less demand from investors. Why haven't 10 years gone up even more? I think Ben sort of gave a, a prelude to the uh, answer to that, or the likely answer to that question, uh, which is that all of those things have been telegraphed uh, well in advance. So mar if markets really are forward looking, and, and we hope they are, then those would have been priced in. Uh, so the exact timing uh, it is not known to the markets in advance, so you can see a reaction to that. And, and so these kind of modest increases um, are reflected in the, in the data. Um, so one thing I would say, we, we had an event um, at, at Kellogg a few weeks ago, and Bob Rubin uh, came out, and so he's a good person to ask your question. Uh, so I asked him your question, uh, which is, you know, why haven't rates moved more and perhaps uh, more pertinently, uh, will they move? What would make them move? Uh, and he said that, uh, that this was in a public forum, so I'm not speaking out of school, uh, literally. And uh, he said that they haven't moved so far. Um, this was in the context of the bond market vigilantes, the famous vigilantes from the 1990s. Uh, and he said, but when they move, they move quickly. Uh, so he didn't Comforting. really give much <laughs> comfort. <Yeah. laughs> Um, ben Page, how will the Tax Policy Center, or how should others in the future um, evaluate whether the bill, whether the, the tax cuts are working, whether they are boosting growth, whether these uh, forecasts actually delivered, given that there's so much other noise in the economy, right? Uh, this is always the, the challenge for macroeconomic uh, research. How should we be, what should we be looking for, and how will you be evaluating in real time and retrospectively whether the bill did what it said it was going to do? So I think Jason and Ben both kind of touched on how difficult it is to, to evaluate uh, given economic data because y you just don't know the counterfactual. You don't know what would be happening if the tax bill hadn't passed. And I think Jason even said that, you know, people who try are making fools of themselves. So I'd want to be pretty careful. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the, the main thing I would, lo I would look at is investment. I mean, that was kind of the, the if, if it's working, it should show up in investment. And, and as Jason showed very well, it's, it's hard to see it in investment, you know. Uh, uh, so because just because of the natural fluctuations and because of not, not knowing what, what would be happening uh, uh, without the tax change, that's, that's certainly what I would be looking at, though. You know, I, I think uh, uh, if you saw kind of big swings, you might, you know, plausibly <coughs> make an argument that the, that the tax cut had something to do with it or on, on the flip side, big swings down that, boy, it sure doesn't look like, like it's doing what it was billed to. But there's always going to be other things going on. Uh, there will be plenty of room for, for anyone trying to make the opposite argument to say, oh, no, that's due to X, Y, and Z. It's not the tax cut. There's, there's always going to be that X, Y, and Z. Mitchell, do you want to weigh in at all about what indicators you're looking at? Um, I'd like, as you said, look at the specific ones. So it's really nice if there's a discrete change. So it would have been a much better experiment if they'd passed the law in July and said any investment for the next six months doesn't get immediate write-off, you do it later. Coming further down the road, the R&D one will be fascinating. 
because you know at the moment it's the same as it's always been but when all of a sudden you have to amortize to what extent do they shove that forward and that's kind of what you're looking for is on the margin are you making an investment you otherwise didn't and so these discrete changes are the nicest place to go look the fact that so much changed here that doesn't make for a great experiment whether it's good policy or not and is it fair to evaluate what's happened in uh, markets so far with increases in buybacks and dividends and I think it's hard to tell because there's been so much change in both demand and supply so when that money comes back it will s the firms will invest in financial real or they're going to give their investors and they'll invest in financial real because the money's got to go somewhere and so then you start to look for disruption in the financial markets we talked about the limit on interest deductibility and the lower tax rate you know, we talked about interest rates on governments, but how about corporates? That's going to, over time, reduce the supply of corporate debt. Um, there's also the change in demand for corporate debt, because those trillions of dollars that were held abroad, they were held in financial securities because it really wasn't a real asset to buy. Otherwise, they would have bought it. So when they bring it back, do they park it in fixed income domestically? Probably not so much. If they really had that much money they don't need, they give it back to investors. Do investors then go and effectively buy the same fixed income that we held through corporations? Now there's no disruption. That would be a really unusual outcome. Or do they get out of fixed income and get into riskier assets equity, create a run-up in equities, or do they get out of fixed income and invest in real assets? And so one other way to think about your government bonds is, to the extent we get more optimistic in how the economy is doing now, we see shifts to equity. Well, that's dampening the demand for interest rates. So that just adds another factor to make it hard to interpret why rates haven't gone up by more. And I, just to jump in, Mitch's answer was really good and, and better than mine. So if, if it's very hard to look at the overall investment, if you were going to see the effects of this specific tax bill, you'd want to look at how it affects specific types of investment. Look at equipment versus structures versus residential versus R&D, and that, that will give you better clues as to whether overall movements uh, you can ascribe to the tax bill if you can see the variations within that that you would expect. Can I, so one point and one question. The one point is that, uh, that increased investment is a necessary condition to higher wages. It doesn't guarantee it, but it's a necessary condition. Aparna has written a lot on this. The, the, you, you get higher investment, which boosts productivity, which boosts wages. If you don't get higher investment, there's no way you can make the case that this tax cut has boosted wages. It's a necessary condition. That's one. Second is a question from Mitchell or Ben or anyone else on this panel, which is that um, you know, I, think, I, I agree with all the caveats about looking at the data. Here's the question. Are you at all troubled by, and not to take over your role, but by the, by the high prevalence of buybacks? Because here's how I thought it was supposed to work, which is that this tax cut unambiguously lowered the user cost of capital from X to Y. And the idea was you had all these investments in between X and Y that corporations were just <laughs> dying to do. It just wasn't profitable enough because the corporate tax rate was too high. So when we went from X to Y, the idea was they're supposed to rush out and undertake all these investments in the Delta. When they're not doing that, when they're just giving money back to, to taxpayers, which goes to other productive investments, but those, those corporations are not evaluating all the other productive investments. They're just evaluating whether or not they're investments in the Delta. So, you know, should we be troubled by the high prevalence of, of buybacks in this context? Ben, you want to go first? And if so, you know, is fine. So, um, uh, I guess, first of all, yeah, I don't, I don't, uh, I don't actually know kind of the, the macro, the, how everything adds up. There's a lot of ad anecdotal evidence. But to the extent that a, a lot of that cash coming back is, is going to buybacks, I don't, I don't think that answers the question because you are kind of unlocking that money. So it's going to different investors. So it seems, it seems clear that the, the firms that had all that cash weren't just dying to use it. They, they weren't the ones who had investments they, they really wanted to use. What, what the proponents would say is, oh, you bring, the, you, you, you bring the money over, you do a buyback, and then the, the investments that that goes to, you've unlocked that money from a firm that was cash rich and didn't have investments and reallocated it to firms that do. I, I don't know how you, you judge whether that's happening, but the buybacks in themselves, uh, don't necessarily seem problematic. Yeah, I was going to say, coming from a corporate, I actually like this result. 
I was worried otherwise because partially, especially the international piece, most of those firms that were bringing back money were not short of cash in the U.S. internally and had really good access to capital markets. So their constraint wasn't money, it was ideas. Historically, what we've often had in corporate America is when I have extra money, I go invest in more stuff. I start with my great ideas, and then I do my good ideas, and then I do my okay ideas, and then I do my dumb ideas, and then I do my really dumb ideas. And so in some sense, cutting it off at zero, I consider a huge success. You also have a bunch of changes in the industry in terms of where these investments are. Um, to get into any business where you need a computer base, you know, 20 years ago required an enormous amount of capital to build out that infrastructure before you do it. Now, because we've outsourced this through cloud computing, instead of a few of these firms investing massive amounts, I've got a whole lot of them investing small amounts. That means each loss tends to be smaller, but I think if it goes back to the equity markets, you return as a buyback, and then the question, you invest in financial assets, you invest in real within the corporation or others. Think about things like consumer product firms. You know, they for years developed most of their products internally. Drug firms for a while invested their developed their drugs internally, and then it got to the point where they realized that small, innovative firms were better at developing the idea, and then we would go buy it, and we would do distribution, we would do regulation, we would do that production. You see the same thing in consumer products. Instead of developing most of those food products we have now, vast majority of that innovation office is in happening in small firms, and then they need it only to buy that acquisition. So they're going to need a war chest, but usually that war chest is one they can accept. But, wait, but what's the mechanism by which returning money to shareholders enables so I, that process? I get a dividend from Apple. I'm not going to eat the whole thing because I've eaten plenty. So now I've got to figure out where to do it. And I can recycle it into treasuries, but that's too safe. I can put it in other public equities that actually need the money. They're the ones raising. Think of IPOs. IPOs are down. But a vast majority of that money now is invested in the private capital markets. So I think of private equity, think of venture capital, think of other alternatives. That's where the demand tends to be. And if you think about the friction of accessing the capital market, a large successful established firm like Apple has pretty good access. It's the smaller ones that have more difficulty. And so both the access to the capital as well as the uh, cost of capital, I think can be more instrumental of those. Yeah, but if you look at NFIB surveys, uh, small firms don't say that they're having trouble getting loans. They, they're no. not, they're, they don't have trouble getting the, uh, the capital that they need and remember, to invest in their great ideas yeah. or so mediocre ideas. in terms of number of small businesses, that's sort of the growth, most of them. Restaurants, auto repair, dry clean, et cetera. But the vast majority of that sample is small businesses that are going to grow at reasonable but not multiple X. They're not where the capital is. To your point, the bank system's pretty good. They've had five, six years of equity profits. They can fund themselves internally. So right, they don't need it. It's the ones who want to grow at multiple Xs, and banks are unwilling to lend because they're too risky. They're relatively new, so they literally have no profits. It's that subset. Small number of firms, to your point, but where maybe some of those more growth opportunities are. Yeah, I just yeah, I just want to reiterate what was said. I you know looking at wage handouts, bonuses, looking at stock buybacks, that's not where the economics is. You know that's that's not the way the tax cut is supposed to work. So so I do think it rep, you know it, it suggests an optimism in the economy. I do think it suggests you know when you look at a company saying um, we have capex plans that are that we're really excited now. We, we we will be investing a lot more. I think it is interesting to look at that. I think it does suggest that people are sort of excited about the tax reform, tax cut, and they're excited about investing. And, you know, we should look at indicators of investments in different types of assets. Um, we, sh we should also be looking at things like inversions, which were a you know, big issue before the tax reform happened, where we were noticing that a lot of U.S. headquartered companies were saying, okay, we're inverting to a lower tax country. Um, I also think looking at repatriations is interesting. But, but you know, the, the, the actual mechanics of how the tax cut is supposed to work is by changing the rate of return on new and profitable investments and saying, okay, now it makes sense for me to invest in this you know, in this project because my after-tax rate of return is a lot higher. And so that is a much longer process and you will have to wait for it. You know, this is, these are indicators that companies are, 
you know, excited about the tax cut, but this is not how the tax cut works. One other thing that you asked what we, what we should be tracking, I mean, one other thing that I think some people are concerned about is on the international side are incentives for multinationals to go ahead and accumulate <coughs> tangible assets abroad to lower their minimum tax liability. So, you know, if, you're, if you have a lot of IP and you might be subject to the guilty, which is a quick digression, guilty and beat win the award for best acronyms in a tax code ever. <laughs> um, but uh, so, you know, are these, are these companies that have a lot of intangible income going ahead and just buying, I don't know, you know, factories in, uh, in Romania in order to lower their, their, uh, their minimum tax burden? I mean, that's one thing we have to, we have to watch closely. I think we're going to take some audience questions now. Anybody? Yeah, so one thing that's been puzzling wait, 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 wait for the mic, please. One thing that's been puzzling me is um, R&D. So, so far, everyone seems to have been taking this at face value, that at some point, forget when it is, companies will have to start amortizing R&D. But I always thought, when I saw this, that this was an ex example of um, tax policy humor, <laughs> that essentially, you know, some <coughs> Republican staff members were sitting around and saying, well, we need so and so much revenue in these years, and so what can we put in there? Oh, I know, let's make companies, you know, amortize R&D that'll get us so much revenue. Nobody expects it to come into effect. And, and, and it, it just, the, I mean, the nature of it is such that it, it just wasn't ever intended to be serious. Am I wrong? As far as implausibility, I would rank that below what happened in 2010 with the estate tax, um, which feels like it's the high bar for, I can't believe it just happened. So um, while I agree, I mean, that you could imagine a world where it was rolled back, crazier things have happened in the tax code. Right. Yeah. And the sequester was intended to be so onerous that it could never go into place. And here we are. So. Lots of comedy in public policy. <laughs> Lots <clearly>. of comedy. <laughs> right here. Thanks. Uh, Joe Fleming with the Pew Charitable <coughs> Trust. I was wondering um, to what extent the, the panelists see uh, variation in economic growth as a result of the uh, tax bill across states and um, how the variation is predicated on whether or not uh, those states have, a, uh, have an income tax. So I... I think so. Uh, I think that that what would be easiest to see and quickest to see would kind of be the variation in demand effects. So, in states where a lot of people were hit harder by the changes to SALT and the mortgage interest deduction, uh, you might get less of a short-term demand side boost. So that's that's um, uh, what comes to mind. Uh, so. The trouble is that those states are tend to be different in similar ways <laughs> from the rest of the country. So uh, the, the flip side is, you know, that's it. There's maybe not a great experiment there in looking at how they differ from the rest of the country. Uh, but that that would be an interesting thing to look at. Anyone else want to take that? No. Okay. Other questions? Back here. Hi, Fred. This is Freddie Wilson from the British Embassy. Um, you touched on it a bit at the end there, but I'd be interested to hear more about your thoughts on the cumulative impact of international provisions on incentives to invest and where to do that. And also, if you've got any thoughts on the extent to which the way Treasury regulate in detail those provisions later this year will impact those incentives. I can talk a little bit about the international provisions. So, you know, we are trying to look at how FIDI and GILTI in particular would affect the location of U.S. multinational investment. And, you know, on the face of it, it does seem like the effective tax rate overseas is still lower. So you have about a 10.5% uh, because of GILTI. And, um, you know, if, if, you're, if intangible investments are located in the U.S., it's still about 1325 And so it does seem to be on the face of it that there's still an incentive to offshore. But if you combine that with what's happening with the OECD's base erosion profit shifting project, we're just saying, well, if you're locating intangibles, you also have to locate real physical activity in those low tax jurisdictions, 
um then we we you, you can come up with scenarios where those non tax costs are high enough that it's still a disincentive for us multinationals to really try to locate that intangible and tangible activity overseas so so i so i do think you know we are still sort of figuring out how all of the provisions work together but if you just look at these two it's still uh, and given what's happening in the oecd countries with the beps project i think it still makes sense that for for us multinationals to locate intangible activity in the us and also there are no disincentives to locate tangible activity in the us either hi uh, frank clement americans for tax fairness i'm just I'm <laughs> curious how, what folks feel about the uh, CBO's analysis on the international uh, provisions uh, th that the evidence was that we're losing about $300 billion a year in, uh, in revenue from profit shifting, but we're only going to recoup about 20% of that uh, through these international tax changes. So in other words, $235 billion or so is still going to be shifted offshore every year. This is, I'm sorry, this is revenue loss due to off profit shifting. Yeah, I mean, you know, I, I, I think it's really tough to model. I don't know what CBO is assuming about, you know, what, what that profit shifting, how, how that profit shifting would change under a new regime. I mean, I guess the assumption is, uh, you know, there, there's still sort of some incentives to locate that activity overseas and how much repatriation would in fact happen as a, as a result of this, um, you know, would affect the revenue estimates. I'm not, I haven't sort of looked at what they're assuming about how the international tax provisions would work. I mean, what I had read was that they, they're still sort of figuring it out it's, and it's unclear just how all of that would work in terms of, um, you know, revenue gains in the U.S. But I don't know, has anybody sort of looked at that? I haven't. No. We have an emailed question. Uh, which is, a boost in growth can occur only through significant increases in investment jobs and job productivity. Given that we have practically reached full employment, who and where are the workers needed to grow the economy to the levels promised by the Trump administration? I, w I would imagine it's not so much employment, but the wage growth. I think that's the missing piece of the puzzle, and the, and the idea was not, you know, the... So the economic theory has never been that this would lead to higher employment, but really that the higher productivity would lead to higher wages. So yes, we're at full employment, but we're still, you know, wage, we're still seeing wage stagnation. And so maybe, you know, that's the, that's sort of the part of the puzzle that. Just one addendum to that is that, you know, while we're, you know, near in, you know, in some, to the extent we can measure full employment, we're yeah. definitely near there. There is probably some small way to go on participation yeah. um, because the participation rate remains low. And, and so uh, a stronger labor market, you know, the historical data uh, show does tend to, you know, pull people back into the labor market. And so in addition to the wage effect, uh, you could hope for that, especially you know, this can cut both ways. Part of the challenge on participation, there's, there's two dimensions of the participation issue. One is demographic, so is, is seniors. And, and so if we can maintain people in the labor market uh, as they would go through their, their normal retirement period, then we might get some movement on participation. Um, the other is from the long-term unemployed or, or people who've been out of the labor market uh, for other reasons. And again, um, depending on where the job growth comes, um, uh, we might get some traction um, there as well. So I wouldn't give up on participation entirely. Yeah, and, and for, for middle-aged men, participation is actually pretty low by historical standards. And so there's a real opportunity there. And if you read, there's a, a, a good paper by Catherine Abraham and Melissa Carney where they go ahead and explain some of the factors. A big factor is trade. So one way to look at this is that uh, in the negative impacts of trade, particularly with China. So, you know, one perspective on this tax bill is a way to sort of realign the incentives that push so many middle-aged men out of the labor market to get them back uh, working again. Um, a, second, a second area where I've actually had my mind changed about this over the past 10 years or so has been the importance of older age workers. And so, you know, this, these are workers who are truly on the margin. Um, uh, you have a pretty transparent choice to retire or not. And these are high productivity workers that have a lot of human capital and keeping them in the economy working longer isn't necessarily a bad thing. That, that oh, means sorry. more and more as you get older, by the way. <laughs> it's more and more meaningful. 
<laughs> and I would say, just to go back to the question, though, to get up to the growth levels projected by the Trump administration, like up to 4% growth, yes, you absolutely need, you can't do that just with capital. There, there has to be something on the labor side. And, yeah, and I was like say, something, immigration has something come up dramatic. <laughs> Uh, in the back, yep. Hi, Heather Long from the Washington Post. Thanks for a great panel. Um, just briefly from each of you, I'd like to hear what's the one thing that you would tell Congress to revisit or change, you know, in the in the tax code. I mean, more than likely, whether we're in a Republican-led or Democratic-led Congress after November, there will be attempts to revisit this. You know, what's the one thing from each of you that you would really like to see done? Well, if I got to go first, if we're talking about the things that came from the TCJA, it would be the pass-through provision. It just seems like it's um, treating similar types of income differently. Uh, it creates all kinds of opportunities for gaming. It goes almost entirely to the highest income households. Um, I, there's not much good that I can think of to say about it. <laughs> okay. uh, and actually closely related to that, um, I would focus on productivity and the um, R&D incentives, but more not R&D only, I mean, just thinking more generally about the, the productivity enhancements and the, the pass-through incentives are especially uh, problematic there, um, but it's broader both in the tax code and in, um, if I can broach the other side of the equation in discretionary spending. I don't know if you want to say clarify or change, but if you think about all these international layer-ons, they have awesome acronyms, and what I've heard today is a group of really smart people that thought very hard about this don't understand it. And so I've got a set of other smart people that run businesses that may not have thought about this nearly as hard, and that creates the complexity and uncertainty Ben was talking about that can't, get, uh, can't be good news. Second piece is part of this is trying to deal with the history of we've always had a geography-based tax system because we had a geography-based economy. I knew exactly where you produce the car. And so much of our production now is geography independent. And so we're trying to graph a geography-based system on an economy that doesn't work that way. And the solution is we're going to make this more and more complex. I have a bet that if I've got a bunch of large, well-capitalized corporations, they can hire a lot of talent. And the more complex you make it, the better the game is for them. Complexity is always a tax on the less sophisticated and the lower capitalized, and always a subsidy on the more sophisticated and the higher capitalized. I would say look for new sources of revenue to offset the revenue loss, the deficit, uh, and ideally a carbon tax. Uh, so if I can just put an exclamation point on Ben Page's answer, the 20% pass-through is by far the worst aspect of this tax bill. Congress should have just lit a half a trillion dollars on fire and it would pretty much be where it was before. It's, it's <laughs> incredibly poorly designed. It doesn't do anything that we intended to do and it loses a ton of money. Um, second place would be, um, you know, again, the EITC. This is a bipartisan idea. We had an opportunity to actually have some bipartisan policies in this bill that would boost uh, labor supply, would be progressive in exactly the right way. Look, we don't know a ton about certain aspects of tax policy. We know a ton about the EITC, and it works, and it should have been boosted in this bill. And uh, I, this, this is uh, totally off the topic, but I would <laughs> say on the, we've kind of been beating up on the tax bill a lot. Uh, one good aspect, if I was going to pick out one good aspect, it's um, taking all those, pu turning so many households into non-itemizers. And there's actually a, a serious gain. Once people, people will have to figure out whether they're still better off with the standard deduction or itemizing for at least a year or two. Once they only have to do the standard deduction, that's a real gain to people who don't have to go through uh, nearly as many pages of the tax code. And it's, it simplifies the tax system. Um, uh, it's better for compliance that you can pick out specific things. Is it bad for charitable giving? Is it bad for the ho residential housing? But um, overall, that has to be kind of the direction a good direction for the tax code to move. And I, I would think it will be, I can't imagine that ever being taken away once people are used to it. Um, 
Yeah, and that goes very much toward Mitchell's point about simplicity. And so we we can, it's easier to see a way to get there on the household side. So reducing the number of itemizers, get, you know, dealing with the AMT, all of those things are little, seem simpler on the household side. On the business side, the big challenge is um, what I would call the weightless economy. Um, so we're used to a system that's built around chunks of capital that have a physical location. Uh, and all of these, going back to the intangibles, uh, the reason they're such a big problem for um, compliance and, and tax avoidance is because they have this weightless quality they can be located anywhere but they drive productivity um, so we, we have to confront that problem in the tax code here it's coming your left your right, the right. Uh, Scott Gregory we talk a lot about wage stagnation and I'm just not quite sure what we mean and I hope you could help me is wage stagnation talking about the cash money I take home at the end of the month or does it take into account the total cost of employment such as the rapidly rising cost of health care rising cost of pension plans the rising cost of all of the other employee benefits Right. I mean, the, so the wage number that we are typically looking at is hourly wages, so just the wage, like the take-home earnings. But even if you look at sort of household incomes, which include a lot of these benefits and transfer programs, I mean, there hasn't been much growth even for the middle class um, over, over the last several decades. So it doesn't matter which indicator you look at. It's, there's been pretty much very minimal growth for the people we care about. I, I would also add, by the way, that if you look at employer-sponsored insurance, premiums have actually been growing pretty slowly, unlike in the individual market. So they get blamed a lot for gobbling up pay raises, but uh, it doesn't seem like that's the yeah. primary culprit in recent years. Other questions? Right so well, wait for the mic, please. It's coming. So uh, it's Charles Rosati with the question. So in the previous, or in all the panels, every the speaker has pretty much said we're in some ways in an unsustainable situation, both because of the fiscal implications as well as all the expiring provisions and all the uncertainty that's going on. So my question is when, when does it become evident that we're in an unsustainable situation to the level that even Congress would have to take action? <laughs> I would say we're in, in, in an unsustainable position now because we can look at CBO focus. Yeah. That's true. When the bond vigilantes <laughs> yeah, <laughs> finally I mean strike? That's, that's what you bond yeah, wake up. Stock market reacts. Yeah. No, I think uh, this is a great question, though. I mean, and if our sort of our collective silence, I think, reflects how good a question it is. But you know, there. I mean, so Bill Gale has he's he's. I don't know, it wasn't a question. I know the answer. No, so Bill Gale stepped out, and he's written a lot about this. But so, what are the metrics by which? sort of the U.S. access to capital starts breaking down. And you can start looking at 10-year treasuries if those start to spike. You can look at our bond ratings. I mean, that's I'm just sort of elaborating on what, what Jan just said. Um, uh, uh, you know, but this could either happen gradually or suddenly. This could happen gradually through, you know, just paying such a large share of our budget to servicing our debt, or this could happen suddenly with a financial crisis. Uh, one will give us some foresight, the other won't. Um, uh, but it, I think it's a terrific question. Other questions? Oh, back here. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm Funke Adaranmu from Results. And I was just curious, um, with the recent passage of like financial reform, uh, with the rollback of Dodd-Frank, I was wondering if there's any like predictions you may have about how this will also factor in with the tax bill. Jan, that's for you. <laughs> Wait, before you take her mic away. Um, could you repeat the crux of your question? Oh, so with um, the like the passage in, in Congress um, of the financial reform, so ro oh. minor rollbacks on um, the Dodd Frank Act, how this may or may not um, have any kind of coinciding impacts with the um, tax bill in any way? 
more like in the financial sector. Yeah, um, and the, the parts of the rollback I've focused on more have been um, the parts uh, focused on community banks and the so the, the smaller banks, which um, smaller banks and, and entry into that sector um, have struggled um, before the financial crisis and were particularly hard hit by the financial crisis. Um, but many of the issues they, they face are also competitiveness issues. Um, so, you know, the, uh, they've been obviously very much in favor of um, the lifting some of the regulatory requirements um, that were mostly intended for for larger banks. So um, I think they're big fans of that relief, um, but it doesn't address all of the issues that that sector faces um, because it's a very, very competitive environment uh, among financial institutions and many of the services that they'd like to provide, like online banking and, and all of the modern things that one looks for, you know, in, in banking on your phone, um, are, those are scale operations uh, and so community the deregulation doesn't solve that set of issues for them, so I think it, it's still a very challenging environment. Uh, so the, I think they're hoping the regulatory reform uh, will help them, um, but these other issues, they're not related to tax, uh, the tax bill, they're not related to regulatory f reform. Uh, I think they're, they'll still be in a challenging environment. The back. Um. It's Carl Polzer. Um, could you comment on the downside risk of the next major recession in terms of the shock, in, in terms of the growth that's needed for, to make this thing work, and especially if it reveals that it's not the lack of ideas on the um, supply side, but the lack of capacity in the bottom half of the distribution to buy things, given the debt that's accumulating and that they didn't get much out of the tax bill? Thank you. That seems like a question for Jan. Yeah. Um, I guess, so So, in your question, in articulating your, your question, you've um, sort of raised some of the issues. I guess the, so in the next recession is the first part of your question, and then the other is about distribution. Um, and the, Ne you know, there, the forecasts about, you know, uh, what the probability of another recession looks like and, um, you know, the, the hazard functions people point to that as a, as a boom gets longer in the, longer in the tooth and, and what's the probability of a downturn. Um, the, some of those measures have been rising, but, but not dramatically so. Um, but we know that it, it's not that booms come with an expiration date, but we know that there will be uh, a downturn and the economy has been um, pretty strong, especially measured by the unemployment rate. Other labor market indicators less so, but measured by the unemployment rate. Um, and, and the concern there is what I articulated uh, earlier is that we've used a lot of fiscal capacity already and taken um, the deficit to about 5% of GDP, even without the alternative fiscal assumptions, um, much sooner. Uh, so the trend was going in that direction, but we're there, you know, five years or so earlier, four or five years earlier than one would have expected. Um, so when, you know, we talk about when, when will the bond market respond, um, what this tells us is probably earlier than it would have otherwise, um, and then that would be exacerbated by the, by the, um, by a downturn because the government, uh, the federal government won't have as much latitude uh, to invoke fiscal stimulus. And, and so that's the concern is that we hit the bond market constraints uh, sooner than we would have otherwise. Um, on the distributional consequences, the I, I think we're, we're not expecting, um, this came up earlier both from Ben and from Jason, um, a lot of st consumption stimulus uh, from, the, from this bill, even though there's a lot of 
Um, income stimulus, translating that through to consumption, uh, I think is pretty difficult, both because the because of the way it's targeted and, and both distributionally uh, and <coughs> in uh, in the time dimension. And so, so two other thoughts on that. I mean, so if you if you sort of separate your question in two parts, one, uh, maybe this wasn't. So if one separated question in two parts. One, will this forestall a, a future recession? I think the answer is yes. It's almost impossible to spend $2 trillion and not do that. The second is, how does this allow us to respond to the next one? Jan mostly answered that. A few other thoughts on top of what Jan said. One, this gets rid of the NOLs, which is one way of sort of allowing companies to smooth out uh, the losses over time. And so, you know, do I believe that the NOLs will survive the next recession? No, I think we're going to do as we've done in the past and make them more generous. Uh, the second is that one of the major strategies we've had for dealing with recessions has been refundable tax credits. So you saw this both at the end of the Bush administration, the beginning of the Obama administration with making work pay tax credits, and then uh, payroll taxes. Um, you know, we have slightly fewer people on the income tax uh, system now, so, you know, those people are the people who would have been on the margin the most. Um, and by taking them off just a little bit, it makes it a little less difficult to use that strategy in the next recession. And we have another submitted email question that I will read uh, from someone, an Irish student, an Irish MBA student at Kellogg, actually. Um, how likely are we to see or are we already seeing a drop in U.S. firms moving tax base operations abroad to jurisdictions like Ireland with regard to economic benefits, separating out political and optical considerations? If this is one of the guys out of my tax class, I'm going <laughs> to get him. <laughs> um, Nicholas Michael is the name. <laughs> yeah, he's from my class. So. Okay. okay. There okay. You go. <laughs> so this cuts multiple ways. Lowering the tax rate creates less incentive to move abroad. Moving to territorial increases it because you never have to pay that out. The ambiguity on these guilty beat, I think, is less to be seen. Part of this is taxes, but there's lots of other factors that drive in. So, and, and these are not, these are decisions that are made slowly and they're decisions that are incredibly difficult to reverse. So if you want to do the experiment watch in the next 12 months, I would expect to see very little. The problem is by the time we figure this out, seven years late, we've embedded this one way or the other. I mean, the simple on the surface pieces, the inversions go away, the trap cash go away, but the more fundamental decision of where we locate it, that's sort of the issue that we've got to figure out now. Other questions? We have a few minutes left. David Brazil. Uh, first and foremost, this Tax Reform Act was a, an effort to increase the competitiveness of U.S. corporations in the international arena. And I think that hasn't really been stated here. Uh, and that was really, I mean, that's been the focus of all the discussions in the last 10 years. Uh, and first of all, and, and we, we, you know, we, you could see it in the Obama um, administration's proposals. You could see it in Chairman Camp's. You could see it in uh, the, shall we forget, the, the destination-based cash flow tax, which we had talked about for a while. But we settled on, it on you know, essentially a territorial, some type of territorial system and a, a corporate tax cut, which had also the benefit of decreasing the cost of capital domestically as well. But there was no attempt, let's say, to um, change the depreciation from what we had before. We sort of meander through again with bonus depreciation on and off, maybe. We'll see how that turns out. Everything else in this bill was a political measure to get that corporate uh, reform done. Uh, we had to give a tax cut to individuals. We had to uh, please the pass-through uh, uh, entities. Well, what's um, your question? The question is, I, I sort of want a response to this because I'm hearing uh, res um, remarks how we're spending all this money and we aren't getting anything. We should have designed it better, but I don't think it. I, I don't think you can just say in the, in the abstract about how you would, I mean, we would all have our great ideas about how we would improve this and they would probably all be different. Uh, 
but in some sense, I'm not sure this is a, a uh, appropriate question. Uh, we did have a, an attempt to boost the growth, and the cost of it is there you know, with an extra. In, in fact, you know, only a, only a quarter of the cost went to corporations. Everything else went to individual. Uh, so one, one way to sort of, if I can just interject here, uh, so one way to sort of characterize a tax cut, which I tried to do at the beginning of my presentation, was this lowers the corporate tax rate. In, in to make uh, U.S. companies more competitive internationally in exchange for a long-run change in how we index the tax parameters, plus a bunch of other temporary stuff that mostly expire by 2025. Um, uh, you know, from that but perspective... Again, the expiration was sort of the outcome of, you know... The no, and, and I agree with you, but, you know, if, if you tell taxpayers... So I think that's a very different perspective. So first, I agree with you that the, that the cut in the corporate tax is the cornerstone of this tax bill. And that's what I try to say at the beginning of the presentation that dwarfs most other things. Um, but in the long run, after 2025, you take this bill at face value, this is just a swap between a lower corporate tax rate and higher individual income tax payments due to indexing, which, which uh, accelerate over time as the gap between CPI and chain CPI materialize. You know, we haven't really talked about the long run here very much. We've kind of been in about a seven-year window, but you know, does that is that does that make Americans better off? I, I don't know. I mean, I think a lot of a lot of voters would say no to that. And I I guess I was thinking actually while you were talking, Ben, uh, while you were, you were giving your talk, uh, that about how a cut in the corporate tax is a relatively inefficient way to promote investment, and. It, it seems to me that it, it's also maybe an inefficient way to promote international competitiveness because you're giving the tax cut to everyone. Um, many of these firms who have, have no ability to move offshore. Or, so I wonder if you had any thoughts about that. That is there a, is there an analogy between um, how how uh, it's inefficient for investment uh, to its international effects. No, can I, I mean, I, I agree with you completely. This was all about the business side reforms. And as I mentioned early on in my remarks, I think, uh, you know, this, we did need corporate tax reform. This, this was something that had been discussed for several decades before we actually got it in, you know, 2017. We, we needed it because the U.S. corporate tax system was out of line with the rest of the OECD. We are seeing, uh, you know, sort of this tax competition across the globe, and we need that investment to, to come to the U.S. So, so I completely agree with you that that's why we, we did it. And uh, the cost of that is the, you know, we have deficits going into the future and we have you know the individual side provisions expiring so uh, so i don't think it's wrong to sort of look at that also and say well there's a cost to it because it could affect the how the corporate tax reform actually plays out you know if you do have deficits and you you you're still banking on that corporate tax cut to get you the bang for the buck it may not work out as well if you're also facing a tax hike in the future or you you know you're raising interest rates which are affecting investments that companies can actually make so i think there is that you know potential for the package itself to crowd itself out to, to a certain extent because you, you haven't <coughs> thought it through carefully. Okay, so, so, so we're about yeah. out of time. Okay. I know Jan wants to get in uh, a last word, so Just please. Just a, a, a quick comment. So on the, um, for the proponents of the bill, Robert Barrow, the other half of the Barrow-Furman uh, team, when the paper was presented at Brookings, um, his view was exactly yours, which was there were many flaws in the bill, but what it, he was willing to swallow those in order to get the, the corporate reform done with the expectation that there would be a chance to come back. And so a more constructive lens on you know the, the concerns that are being raised is that there's a second bite at the apple and trying to uh, be constructive about that uh, that second tax reform is the I think the aim of many of the comments here well thank you so much to our panel and, and thank you for joining us thank you. Thank you.